the number 21 car, the Bitcoin car, takes on the Indy 500. <coughs> Today, the Bitcoin car races for human freedom, financial literacy, financial inclusivity, savings technology, peer-to-peer -peer censorship resistant money, the hardest money mankind has ever come across. When we die, all that's left is what we've made. And Bitcoin is arguably the most important thing humanity has ever made. I don't give a fuck about the price. Are we in a bear market, a bull market? Is it a dip? Do you know what's really going parabolic? The amount of individuals around the world that are uniting and fighting for what Bitcoin stands for and what it means for the world. Saquon Barkley, NFL player, Diplo, a DJ, El Salvador surfers, baristas in Australia, all united by one singular mission that is Bitcoin, that represents a world that they want to live in, that they want their kids to live in, and that they want their kids to live in. The Indy 500 has never sold more merch in countries than this year. More countries are tuning in than ever before this year because of Bitcoin. We're raising Bitcoin awareness and we're supporting the open source engineers that are developing our ability as individuals to have financial independence. To all the exchanges, to all the wallets, Coinbase, donate, support, even if it's a penny. We have to support the open source engineers that are working on the most important open source project of all time. To the community, let's do what we do best. In an unprecedented time for humanity, in an uneasy macro environment, we're supporting Bitcoin. That's hope. An asset and monetary policy we can rely on, and we're going to fight and stand for what we think pushes the world in the right direction. And with that being said, let's go win a fucking race! Too early. Happy Bitcoin Tuesday, freaks. Oh, happy New Year. Welcome to a very special Citadel Dispatch. I'm your boy, Matt O'Dell. This is Citadel Dispatch 24, live from Miami. We got the whole crew here. We have a our first live in-person audience for Citadel Dispatch. I'm fucking hyped. Shout out to the ride or die who are in this room with us today. And also of course, to the ride or die that join us in the live chat every week. Um, you guys make the show what it is. Um, with all that said, I would love to introduce this insane cast of Bitcoiners we have here today. This is by far the, the, the largest guest list for a single dispatch. So I look forward to seeing how much chaos happens here. Um, I'm going to start from this direction and go that way. Um, we have we have Anthony over here. Uh, you want to raise your hand when when I call on you. We have we have Ty, we have Evan, hey, hey. we have Ben, hey. we have McCormick, and we have Wiz. What's up, guys? Thanks for joining us here. What up? Thanks. Cool. You enjoy yeah. Miami? Oh, love it yeah. so far. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we got a beautiful view behind us. The price is not 200k. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, still, we still have some time. We still, still have some time. It's still in play, obviously. But it sort of feels like it. It sort of feels like we're at 200K, oh, you know? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Look, his jeans are ripped. Of course not. It's a popper. So, I think the best place to start is, will Taproot be activated by the end of this difficulty adjustment period? Does anyone have a strong opinion here? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like an expo. <laughs> well, of I, course it is. Yeah, I mean, but yeah. you're going to lose a bet, right? Yeah, I'm. A, I'm I, I'll probably lose two million sats to Evan if if it does. It won't get activated. It gets locked in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The activation happens in November, actually. 
um, you know, barring it gets locked in in one of these six periods. So we're on period number three. I for sure thought we were going to get in uh, the last period, but, you know, some people were sort of dragging their feet, updating their nodes and whatnot. But uh, this third period seems like a shoe in barring any shenanigans. I think we're at something like 97.8% of the blocks are showing up green right now. So, uh, yeah, some real shenanigans will have to Stay go. Stay on Um <laughs> So I actually jumped ahead with Tapper. We could talk about it in a sec, but it's kind of boring. Uh, what did we, we, we started? We started this fucking show with our boy Jack Mahler's fucking going off, going off at the fucking camera at the Indy 500 um, right before the Bitcoin car race in the largest sporting event on the United States calendar and the largest event since COVID. And we had a Bitcoin car that was in first place for 32 fucking laps. Uh, was it the largest since COVID? Yeah, there was like 200,000 people there. That's a lot of people. And uh, I mean, I I was there in person. I thought it was fucking unreal. What did you guys think, you know, viewing it on, viewing it on TV? Yeah, I was on the beach, so I was just watching on my phone, seeing the laps go by. It was, it was amazing. Now, you and Peter, you guys are both there, right? How was that? It's pretty emotional, wasn't it? Like the highs and lows. Just the heart, just constantly yeah. racing. I mean, he was in the lead for 32 laps, but most of the race he was first or second. And when he was second, he was behind his teammates. And 100 laps in, we were all saying, fuck, he could do this. We were like hugging each other, like fucking jumping up and down the suite. Fucking Jack's going off about freedom and like how we're going to fucking win everything. It was fucking fire. Yeah, it was good, but we were all like wrecked afterwards. It's a very low time preference sport. Fucking 200 laps, you know? Yeah, you got to pace your excitement, right? We got so excited. We did not pace our excitement. Uh, we we did, stay you literally, your heart doesn't stop, ra stop racing until the race stops. Not two, we're all jumping around. <laughs> Talk a little bit louder. Lap two. <laughs> we all got excited. We were jumping around. Uh, no, but it was mad, that second lap, we're all outside, and he comes around the we, corner, he's in the lead. We're like, what the fuck? Before we even started the race, we're in the pit, we're in the pit, and fucking, you know, the, the Bitcoin car is, is starts as the number three car. So they do this qualifying in the week before, where they determine out of the 33 cars, where you start in position, and it's three rows of, of 11. It's 11 rows of three. Um, and where you start obviously gives you a way bigger advantage because it's hard to overtake after the race starts. Um, and the, the number two car was, the number one and number two car were both banks. So like you couldn't write, you couldn't write the story fucking better. And specifically the PNC car was the number two position and they were right next to us in the pit. And Russ just walks up to them, is just standing there, like six feet away from them, just heckling them, just going at them, like, have you, you should switch to Bitcoin, you know, the banks are dead, just like going after them. And they were so fucking pissed off. And then they ran out of gas on the, on the fucking race. And the strike guys jumped right on top of it. They tweeted out the transaction decline, PNC Bank. <laughs> But I, I, I was joking that they were playing with fire. Like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in a month you just have uh, all strike transfers out of PNC Bank just get fucking <laughs> just get blocked. Yeah. But that was that was pretty fucking cool, right, Pete? That yeah, was really cool. It was a privilege, actually. Uh, yeah, it was a real honor to be there. Yeah. And good um, on Jack. I mean, the work he did to, uh, firstly, he designed the car himself. Uh, he hyped everyone up. He's raised a bunch of money, which bunch will go to Bitcoin death. Uh, yeah, big shout out to Jack and everything he did there. So what was the structure? Was it like uh, some percentage goes to the car, some percentage goes to the developers? So normally they have the car sponsored by uh, like an energy drink or like Cheetos or something. And he this year said he wanted to do something different and was happy to go for a Bitcoin car, but they had their certain basic costs they had to cover. So once it got, that got covered, then it was like a 70-30 split. Yeah, right? 70 goes to open source development and 30 goes to the car. Yeah. Um, they were also, they sold more merch than they've ever sold before. It was going globally, like to countries that they've never sold merch to. Like when you normally have a sponsor, the sponsor doesn't bring fans with you. With Bitcoin, we're all fucking obsessed. So like all of a sudden, like the engagement was crazy. They're getting merch from all over the place. When we were walking to the pit, 
Like everyone was stopping and looking at the Bitcoin car, right? Yeah, it was the car to look at. You go to the PNC one, there was no one. They had like a little fence around their car. <laughs> And the guy was just sat there. Like, the fence was there because of us, right? <laughs> yeah. They like knew we were coming. They knew they were next to the Bitcoin car. They needed the, the little fence up. Yeah, the classic <laughs> bank move, you know? Put a... Put a... <laughs> About the rope. It was close. It was, yeah, it was like one of those, you know, like elastic... Uh, yeah. yeah, there's no such thing as a PNC fence. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They know what... Oh, that's my favorite bank. <laughs> um, and then the other thing I was thinking is, is like just... We kept saying, I mean, maybe it's a cliche, you know, I'm always fucking bullish, right? But I was getting ridiculously bullish and we just kept all turning to each other like, oh, we're so fucking early. You know, we're so fucking early. And, you know, in 10 years, I think like most of these teams are going to be owned by Bitcoiners. There's going to be like the one Fiat car and then like all Bitcoiners are just going to be throwing their egos around racing each other, right? <laughs> like there's like... It'll, it'll become the norm really quick and probably in all sports, you know, we have like our one EPL team you know, we have Watford. It's just going to be, it's just going to all be dominated with like Bitcoiners and egos. And I feel like we'll know we really made it when all the conspiracy theories involve, you know, Bitcoiners like meeting behind closed doors, like Illuminati shit. Well, that'd be fun. <laughs> Can't wait to do that. I mean, that's what this week is for, right? It's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not priced in, right? But uh, first time ever watching IndyCar. We all just became fans on the fly. So let's fucking go. Um, I, I, it seems like a partnership that will last a very long time, and I'm very excited about it. The IndyCar will be at the conference. Um, I'm not sure if it's being, if there's going to be a charity auction around it, but there, there's literally a scannable QR code on the fucking car. And you can still donate this week, right? Like the, the, the donations are, are, are is ongoing constantly. So strike.me slash racing, support the car, support our rookie of the year driver. Um, Support open source development. It's just really fucking exciting. And they were all pumped. The team, the Ed Carpenter Racing team was super excited. Uh, they if, if they really bought in. It felt like they were really a part. Of, it wasn't a publicity stunt. You know, it, it, I, and I could see a lot of people on the sidelines thinking it was a publicity stunt. Don't blame them. You know, we had a Dogecoin car like what, like four years ago. Um, that was a publicity stunt. Like, I don't think the driver was like, Super on board with Dogecoin, you yeah. know, but uh, this didn't feel like a publicity stunt, right? No, not really. No, I mean, it, it just felt. I don't know. It's hard. To, it's really hard to explain it. It just felt like our time was coming. Like, you know, it, it almost like if it had been a few years ago, it would have been like slightly embarrassing. Oh, there's a Bitcoin weirdo. But when you went, like you said, when you went to the car, the car was packed with people taking photos. Like, and. and I thought every car was like that, and then we we stepped forward. There's hardly any people around the other cars. Everyone was interested in the Bitcoin car, and then you would see something like someone go, "Oh, where can I get one of those hats?" Like everyone was hyped and pumped for it. I mean, yeah, the merch was dope. Jack designed all of, like it was, and it was it wasn't just the car. It was like all the equipment, all the you know, all the all the pit crews. They were all wearing you know matching Bitcoin uniforms. It was everything. It wasn't just the car. It was really cool. I mean, we had Saquon there, we had Russ there, we had Jessica Vaughn there. It was a show. Yeah. It was awesome. It was a really good time. And we got a helicopter in. But yeah, you guys were on the helicopter. That's a real flex. Yeah. Wait, tell us about that. What happened? Well, I got up in the morning. No, no, so the night before, just before we were going off, and they said, oh, we're getting a helicopter into the track. I was like, what? <laughs> I actually petrified a helicopter. Yeah. I was like, fuck. And they didn't want to do it, but I was like, it's, it was Jack, Jessica, uh, and Russ, and Dylan all going on helicopters, so I've got to do it, but the whole time I was sat there. <laughs> <laughs> it's the richest way to die. <laughs> it's horrible. Like, yeah. Well, well I'm glad you guys made it all right. <laughs> so, IndyCar, that was dope as fuck. Uh, now we can go back to Tapper. We're gonna have Tapper probably signal this, this uh, this difficulty adjustment period. Um, the main pool that isn't signaling right now is Marathon Pool, former Marathon Digital Holdings, formerly Marathon Patent Group, professional patent trolls. Um, when you say main, I mean, they're pretty insignificant as far as- uh, But they're the largest that isn't, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what are they, like 5% or something? No, last year, 2% or something. Yeah, 1.7. 2%? Yeah. 
So they, what, they had like a press, a press release yesterday yeah. where they said they're signaling, they're going to start signaling for Taproot. Yeah, yeah. And stop filtering transactions. Look like a deep fake. <laughs> yeah. So you just yeah. checked just before the show, right? Like they're still not actually signaling for they're, Taproot. They're not signaling. They're at, and, they're at 1%. And it still says OFAC compliant block <laughs> at, on every block in the tag. Well, let's give them like a day or two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like yeah. One of the things is like, I mean, I've been pretty consistent that people should be, uh, you know, skeptical. Let, actions speak louder than words. Yeah. Let, you know, let's see how things play out. You know, lower your time preference. Don't fucking like rush into speculation and shit. Um, but one thing that people should keep in mind is, is as far as whether or not you're signaling in a block versus a press release, it's relatively the same trust model. Like they can signal whatever they want to put in there. That doesn't mean they're actually running Taproot. Um, it's like it's almost the same as a as a press release, right? That's true. Yeah, we can hardly know if they actually stop uh, filtering transactions or not, so you can't really verify that. Well, we can see like, if like high transactions, yeah. like high fee transactions. Yeah, yeah, you can right? try to to calculate that. Would would they still be down to filter transactions if they could still activate activate Taproot? Like, is it just the client that's preventing them now from filtering the blocks or? Wait, what? No, it's really curious. It's related, really. Not yeah, related. it sounded like they forked Bitcoin Core and then they added all this filtering uh -huh. stuff to it. And now they're like, well, we still want to signal Taproot, so we'll upgrade our client and we're not going to use our fork that's filtering OFAC anymore. We're going to upgrade, we're going to signal for Taproot, um, and, and which just makes me. And then we'll do the censorship in the future. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> which makes me think, well, what, if, if you don't give a fuck about OFAC compliance right now and you're just going to throw that away then why even do it in the first place? No, they're not going to throw it away. These types of companies like, you know, they were patent trolled before, right? So it's like, Great you know, they, yeah, they, <laughs> um, you know, they have a plan. They want to be those rent seeking, you know, like pieces of shit, right? So it's like, okay, we got a lot of flack for this. We're going to abandon this, but down the line, you know, they're not going to stop. So we should all keep an eye on these guys, no matter what. Yeah. Constant vigilance. Yeah. You don't really know. If this is what they really wanted, or if it was a community pressure, probably. I mean, we really made a lot of noise last week on Twitter. And yeah. I like to think we had uh, some influence on this uh, bending of the knee. Well, I think also because um, Sailor was showing uh, Marathon too. Um, you know, he he got a lot of the flack, uh, like associated with Marathon. Like, why are you showing this OFAC compliant nonsense, right? And I think yeah, Nidig's yeah. pretty big in, in oh. Marathon. Really? And uh, Nidig, you know, Ross Stevens, they seem to get it as well. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they see a lot of the um, blowback. And, and I mean, on the press release, the marathon press release on the bottom, it had an explainer about Nidig in there. I don't know, like, what that, what, you know, what that reasoning is, but they must be, um, perhaps. They could have got the press release from Nidig, too. Uh, Nidig could have came yeah. in and said, hey, you guys have to stop this. I do kind of feel yeah, like Sailor yeah. was involved as well. So, so was Mara part of that closed door mining yes. meeting that happened? Okay. So even more reason to hate them. Yeah, I mean that that's my biggest concern is not the environmental side. It's this OFAC. It, it, it's it's having a large group of miners deciding on blacklisting transactions and yeah. not including them in. And I as long as that group is less than fifty one percent, it should be fine. And you might have to pay a higher fee if you're if you're doing a, a transaction that's being censored, but another miner should pick it up. Um, but specifically as a coin join user, you know, this is a very it's very visible on chain. It's a very easy thing for miners to just be like, we're not gonna, you know, uh, we're not gonna mine coin join transactions. But I think it's important as users that we we pick up that coin join number. So that it'll be visible if they try to do that. Like if they do that, and they, they need to be alienating a large amount of UTXOs. Like I feel like it's a visible thing. I'm really curious on your opinion, Wiz. Well, you that's know. why it's kind of important for the transaction fee markets to develop, right? Because if, if you can mine empty blocks and get huge block rewards, then there's not a huge incentive to uh, you know include all these high value coin joint transactions. But as the block reward goes down, the transaction fees go up. Then more uh, the mining revenue is directly from the transaction, so they really don't want to censor them. Now they're just doing it because they're going to get a block reward anyway, right? Mm -hmm. 
but, like, yeah. but there was still uh, economic difference. Like when we were starting to see the first marathon OFAC blocks, right? The next block took like another, like almost quarter of a Bitcoin in rewards from the, the fees, right? So we actually got to price what the virtue signaling cost, which was mm. pretty interesting. Awesome. But so, it, it didn't actually censor any transactions, right? It's just yeah. like pure virtue signaling. There's that recent yeah, project yeah. that came out where it's actually comparing what should have been the next block to what the miners actually mined. And, and I don't know if to date we've actually seen the marathon censor anything, right? Like we can kind of, we have the tools now to see if they are censoring transactions. And I just don't know if we've like verified if they are or not. I mean, the OFAC I mean, list isn't that big. Right? It's not, it's so. not. No. no, but all the transactions in the block were projected to be in that next block anyway. So it wasn't really any hmm. But the virtue signal of putting it in the tag yeah, is yeah, almost the worst part, right? right? Just like every time they mine a block, it says OFAC compliant block. And they're almost insinuating that anything that doesn't say that is a non-compliant block. And the chain analysis move that we've seen with chain analysis in the exchanges is they're going to, the, the playbook is you lobby to the, to the point where you make all your competitors have to comply with it too. Like you make, you make the need for your service to exist in the first place. I guess that's kind of why there's so much uh, mining hash power in both China and USA now, and probably Russia too. You get like a nice mix of all these jurisdictions where that are hostile to each other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the game theory of Bitcoin yeah. really shines. Yo, Wiz, jump in, s split them over here. Yeah. Yeah. Here we oh. go. Yeah. Okay, now you guys can hear Wiz better. He's, he's got his uh, important insights. We need to be up to Wait, here. wait, before we move on, what's the name of that new site that says, uh, you know, what, what the block template looks like versus what actually got uh, Mempool Observer, Observer or something, I think? Mempool Observer. Anyway, it's, it's an excellent tool and it's got a whole lot of value. Uh, you guys should check it out. If someone could link it in the comments, that'd be great. Mempool Observer. Yeah, it's a Mempool Observer. Well, mempool space has it, but uh, we don't actually display it. So it's in, it's on the task list to do, but we, uh, we do calculate, uh, Simon already calculates the, uh, the accuracy, right? So uh, if we project a certain amount of transactions are gonna be the next block, it's usually like 97 to 99% accurate, um, whatever actually gets fined. Hmm. That makes sense, that's how we know. That's like the early warning system, right? Yeah, but I mean, it's always hard to tell exactly because of variance and network latency. And, you know, when the miners start mining a block template, um, there's, there's just a huge amount of lag when the new transactions are coming into the mempool, right? Right. So we have, we have, I have a, a bunch of money on the line about Taproot. If, tap, if, if Taproot locks in this period, I lose 2 million sats to you. I lose a bottle of whiskey to you. I lose a million sats that I have to send to HRF for losing to Marty. <laughs> um, we probably not gonna hit 200k by conference day. Fuck that one up. <laughs> um, and then, what was it? I had one more that I that I messed up as well. You should probably oh. bet me, right? Yeah, we're we're betting a million sets, right? Do we have a bet? No, I don't okay. care. All my, <laughs> all my conversations are recorded, so I expect the clip out of of the dispatch where that bet happened. If you're gonna try and. Uh, I don't delete tweets either, so I expect on the tweet. No, the do we think the mempool is going to clear? Do you think the mempool is going to clear this adjustment period? Because that's the other thing I've been flexing on. And now, right now, I'm pretty sure we're at like one sap per byte is going through right I now. I told you it's going to last forever, okay? <laughs> but I think the conference... You don't really think it will. Not forever, but there will be periods where it comes back, you know, in the foreseeable future at least. Well, just, not forever, forever. Well, the floor is just no longer zero or one sat, right? Now the floor is variable and sometimes it goes up yeah, to four, yeah. five, even 10, 15 sats, right? Well, so in five years, in five years, do you think, does anyone on, on this, on these two couches think that you'll be able to, you know, have a one sat per byte confirmation confirm. Wait, when? In two years? In, In two five years. years. Five years? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, not, it's going to become yeah. more and more it's increasingly rare, rare yeah. right? But there's still going to be opportunities for that until, you know, the whole world adopts this thing. I yeah. think uh, I, we still got a lot of wiggle room. I don't think so. But what I do think is that a lot of people are trying to be more smart with their UTXO set right now. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we're seeing, I mean, even even at Bottle we're seeing more um, consolidation periods, more areas where we're trying to have the best UTXO set that we can. So we don't need to consolidate. Because right now, I think, you know, there's been a lot of like, you know, uh, 
four or five uh, Saccharbyte transactions going through that are hundreds to thousands of, of UTXO sets being consolidated. So I think we're going to start seeing um, exchanges have better practices around UTXOs and things like that that will help. But yeah, I don't know. Five years, one sat per byte? I don't think so. Well, there, there's probably going to be like um, out of band. Uh, there's probably going to be a secondary market for mempool space and blockchain space will develop, right? So um, people will make private deal, private deals with mining pools. Um, you know, maybe the fees they pay are even like zero in the transaction, but they'll have some kind of private arrangement with miners. Maybe I think that's something we could we could see soon because businesses typically want to have some kind of uh, regular. Like predictable, predictable, yeah, yeah, for business yeah, yeah. case purposes, right? So it's like a subscription service almost. Exactly, yeah. So I recently used it's called like txpush.com, and I was uh, I had a Lightning channel that opening that was going to be too it was too low of sat per byte and it wasn't going to go through within two weeks. Um, what I actually saw, I wanted to use that service to pay a miner out of band to open up to, to mine my transaction that was too low. They wanted to charge like 50 bucks. They're like, I, don't, I forgot how many sats it was at a time, but 50 bucks. And <coughs> that was just like way too much. So I think like those services are great. Um, I think if they could lower their fee a little bit more, that would be better. But they did allow me to pay with Lightning. Um, so I could push the transaction faster with Lightning, which I thought was pretty cool. It's just, it was just too high of cost. Yeah, I think their pricing structure is, um uh, not it doesn't make sense in reality. Like they're just kind of saying like, yeah, our price is a hundred bucks or two hundred bucks. Like it's um, it's not a big enough market to like. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The market's, the market's not efficient, yeah. so they're just kind of quoting um, this kind of weird pricing model. So I think that's what's going to happen, right? Is a real market will develop for like mempool space. I mean, also like right now, I mean, how many people are using services like that? It's usually like if there's like an oh shit thing, like I really, really, really need this to go through so yeah, it's like you you might be willing to pay 100 bucks well you can always cpfp it or rbf it usually right. um or if it gets purged then you can abandon it and make a new transaction so there's lots of things you can usually do the out of band prioritization is probably like something that'll only happen maybe like five years from now maybe two years from well now. it's already it's already kind of happening right but not yeah it's just not a mature market yet exactly yeah but there's there's definitely some like oh shit use cases where people just need to get it confirmed. Right? And I wouldn't be surprised if like exchanges are already having conversations with large miners, right? But they typically own. use such a high fee, um, they always want to get into the next block, right? Like if you look at these, um, we used to call it BitMEX o'clock when they would do their- At 9 a.m. Eastern. Dude, they would just flood the fucking- It was like pools. hilariously unoptimized. <laughs> yeah. They would just spend like, um, thousands of dollars on a single transaction fee for like no apparent reason, just because they, and, and all of their um, UTXOs were like these huge multi-sig wallet uh, spends. So that the transaction size was like several blocks big, right? It was like several megabytes worth of transactions all just at the same time. So fortunately, I think now they optimize it though. I always thought it was interesting that they, um, you know, were clearly running a business that American regulators didn't like uh, and they, didn't try at all to hide their on-chain activity. Like all their addresses are three VMAX, like they addresses. were at the yeah, time. You know, they were always sending out the withdrawals at the same time every day. They just didn't have, didn't care at all. The it wasn't a concern at all. Well, they got. They got are they using a native segwit now? As they now. I don't know. They have KYC now, so. Oh yeah, that's fine. Nobody is. Yeah. <laughs> um, Talk about native segwit. I don't know if it's been mentioned recently, but. Blockchain.com started doing it. Yeah. Native Segway. Finally. And they were yeah. one of Nobody should use them. <laughs> no one yeah. should use them, right? But it's projected that like 30% of like it's, transactions are coming from I think more than that, right? I think it's like Is it really that high? Well, it's they, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> well, it's just because it's a network effects. They were like first to market, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And so they were the first one to offer that like API. That was one thing we were thinking about doing with mempool space is to, to basically just implement the same uh, blockchain, that info API, so that people could easily migrate. Yeah. Because now we, we support um, blockstream.info API. So if we have added the blockchain.info API, then we could uh, allow everyone to easily self-host their own uh, blockchain explorer APIs and, and uh, you know, decentralize the concept of block explorer. But like, so we like got a little bit derailed there. I can't, I just can't see how one sat per byte 
will still <laughs> confirm in five years. If, like the block size isn't if, like block space isn't going to get less scarce. And people are adopting, like, we're about to see, I mean, unless I'm just completely fucking wrong, unless a bunch of us are completely wrong, like, we're about to see a massive push of retail adoption towards the end of this year. You know, usually in these cycles, you see magnitudes, right, of increases. Right. And we've never, like, how does that, no, there's no, how there's do no you circle life. both of those together and then end up in a situation where... You know, mempools are just not going to always be fucking clogged. Well, Satoshi designed the block reward to trend towards zero. And so obviously the fee transaction market has to develop more than one sat per byte to be able to compensate miners. Right? We had we had Adam on the on dispatch together and he said I was like two hours into the show or whatever. He said he was like, if if fees got to like a thousand dollars or I guess whatever, like equivalent purchasing power of a thousand dollars. And he would support a block size increase. And like, I feel like that was probably untenable, will never happen. And so is he saying that he doesn't think we're gonna hit that amount? And then to me, when people don't think that, that's usually when we're definitely gonna hit it, you know? Especially someone like that. Like, but a block size increase could be many things, right? I mean, maybe there's some new technology uh, smart people figure out a few years from now where you can batch transactions in an even more right. creative way. More efficiency. Yeah. yeah. So block size Layer two, increase. stuff like that. Right? Like Segwit was a block size increase, right? And right. Taproot will be similar in, in right. its own way. So you get to a thousand dollars for a transaction, how many wallets will be trapped when they to spend? Well the fiat value doesn't matter, right? It's more of a yeah. like because it's priced in sats. Exactly. And the so that's why we we should never like I quoted Adam because Adam said that, but we should never talk about fees in dollar amounts because it could be a one sat per byte transaction that costs a thousand dollars, right? And yeah. just sats are just fucking the standard. So yeah, but thinking about people who work on their DCA set up and stuff. Like, yeah, you get so fucked so quickly. Yeah, you're fucked. And you, I feel like it turns it could turn very quickly on people, and we saw that, right? So so the last three difficulty adjustments we had were double digit difficulty adjustments. We had a double digit down, a double digit up, and then a double digit down again. That's exceedingly rare, right? Like I, to me, that's like Bitcoin should be, you, you shouldn't panic, you know, you shouldn't um, fud yourself out of generational wealth, but well, that was you, your, your alarm bell should be ringing when that's happening, right? Like that shouldn't be happening on the regular like that. So what's the narrative, the rainy season yeah. in China or- and then the Do you remember that? Has that narrative been a historical narrative to you? I mean, it might've just been less significant back then. And now- Are there less Chinese miners as a percentage than there used to be? Maybe in that area, right? Or no? I, I, I mean, Mining, so, so a lot of people are still using the older S9 generation hardware to mine, right? Which would be totally unprofitable at certain um, price points or even, um, you know, like if they had to, if their electricity is four cents versus three cents versus two cents, it might be a huge difference for their profitability or non-profitability, right? So if they had to move, like physically pack up all the miners and go somewhere else, they might have actually had to. You can continue talking. <laughs> Yeah, the like, audience got me a beer. <laughs> Citadel Dispatch is filmed in front of a live studio audience. <laughs> yeah, do we think is is China is China banning Bitcoin this time for real, or is it just uh, for real? No, of course not. It's it's like a yearly banning, Mo monthly, monthly ban. <laughs> Some people seem pretty confident that you know mining is going to be illegal in China, and it's monthly. In two weeks. Yeah, yeah they, they seem monthly. Yeah, they seem really confident the last six times. Well, you know, <laughs> it's like exactly. It's a matter of how pragmatic it is. Like, you just can't. Well, I bet you there's also like some like nuances that we're not getting because you know like we're not in that world. So it might be like certain types of miners, or like yeah. maybe those who are using coal or whatever. Yeah, we need some um, boots on the ground freaks in China to give yeah. us the. But the fact oh, of the matter is, we still have one Sats confirmed. Like that's for sure. So I think Matt puts it best when he says like, hey. There's a lot of fud going on about how miners are leaving the pack of house they're going to Kazakhstan and all these other places. But hey, guess what? There's one stats confirmed. Like, I mean, just look, just verify that. But, and sure, we've had right. Like that's ridiculous, right? Like that should just not be a. 
But there's no way the difficulty adjustment period while miners are fucking scrambling and panicking, we're having one separate bytes going through. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, it was like overnight, half the hash power disappeared, right? And 6102 was freaking out. He was like, this is what it would look like if a 51 uh, percent attack was going to happen. That's exactly what it would look like when you have the uh, uh, like a hash rug pull. Yeah, but it, it all came back, right? Like a couple weeks later and then... Well, do you remember what the claim for that one was? It was... It was like the Chinese government of this province decided to like shut down like a street of Bitcoin miners or something, right? Well, they were like, some, oh, they turned the power off because of a coal accident. Yeah, some accident, right? Some fire at some coal plant or something. How do we know if any of this shit actually happened? That's what I'm saying, right? You can't really know. You can't really know even if no. this is just accident and because everything is random. I mean, you, you're, you're, there's you're a chance that Everything stuff. is random, like theoretically. <laughs> this could just all, there would be no change in hash rate and theoretically, there is a chance that the randomness prevailed and we've had this down drop and up, up swing and down drop and difficulty adjustment. Like, it is random. So, yeah, right? so like, you cannot verify anything here. Exactly. Yes. I mean, I mean you, you have to go check or something. I think we are looking at the simulation. But no, we have like, like Bitcoiners like, won't shut up on Twitter about like fake news and mainstream media is lying to you. And then like so some like a random excuse from China comes down and everyone's like, well, that's definitely what's happening. Yeah. Was well, it the same people though? Yeah, a lot of times it's the so. same people. <laughs> I don't know. Get it together. Um, well, I, I mean, so I mean, the difficulty adjustment is working as designed. Does, does anyone here think, I mean, what do we think the hash rate in China is right now? Like 60% or something, 50%? More than that, right? It's hard to say because even if you had a lot of mining hash power in America, you could still route it to like a Chinese mining pool and it would look like the Chinese uh, mining pool hash rate is much higher than it actually is. So that's hard. That's hard to say. Like the miners are kind of like, or the mining pools are kind of like a proxy in that sense. I guess, so, I guess my point is in five years, do, does anyone here think that less than 30% of the hash rate will be in China? Less than 30? Yeah. Well, no, because they have a huge amount of hydro. Thinking about gonna yeah. that. No, I mean, the hydro dam yeah, is a huge thing. Exactly. It's going to be the biggest hydro dam ever. Like that's going to change well, a lot of stuff. Then they like overbuild in hydro and they're like, oh, we can't use all this one. There's like an entire city where the central government forced everyone in that city to become like an electrical engineer. This is like a central planning thing. And then they said, you know, your, your, the entire purpose of this city is just to generate electricity for the country if we need it, like strategically, right? So that's why they have so much excess central planning. Well, I mean, you'd have to get like nuclear power, yeah, right? Nuclear like power. if Russia wants to make some state operated nuclear, maybe Chernobyl, you know, would be a good use case. I don't know. Well, also, like Gen 4 nuclear, I mean, I literally know next to nothing about it, but that's what a lot of like miners are hyping. They think that Gen 4 nuclear is going to be the thing that's going to take off in the US. And it's like really easy to bootstrap um, and like get off the ground. Like, uh, as far as like profitability and stuff like that, like current nuclear plants, like you have to look so far in advance to like, uh, you know, project like, oh, when are we going to break even? But with these, since they're like more compact and more, you know, cheaper, um, you're going to be able to have like these uh, smaller nuclear plants all across the country. I don't know if this is actually the case. I think it's, uh, you know, easier said than done. But if that happens, then you know, you might see miners transitioning that. Also, do you think the political climate in America is going to that result that in a bunch of man? Yeah, that's that's the one thing though, right? Like the the political climate and like the um, you know the fud against nuclear is humongous. In states yeah but it's hard to also just say in like a blanket terms like um, in america it's like things have become like so divided and you gotta look like uh -oh. at a state by state thing you know what yeah. i mean we're gonna have yeah. fracture is that what you're saying oh eventually <laughs> but not right now but like you could definitely see something happen like that in like you know texas or maybe down here in florida yeah. or you know somewhere remote well there's some power plants in like new york that were doing mining right not like nuclear, but just traditional. Yeah. yeah, there's some some carbon neutral deal that I heard about in New York, but at the same time, there's also like a moratorium for the next three years going on. I yeah. think it depends on the source. And I think mining's gonna be like pretty much pushed out of New York for a little bit of this. No, like, New York's got a lot of problems. They're trying to tax it, right? Like trying to add additional regulations. Yeah. Well, so, uh, of course, all these bureaucrats want to, you know, their get their tax to my, keep the thing going. Yeah. yeah, my Bitcoin miners were running for years, and I never solved a single block. I was really unlucky. Oh, ah, <laughs> man, that sucks. <laughs> We have Romario Hoddle in the comments asking if this is the 
the Ben Kaufman. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. The yeah, one I, and only. Yeah. He made it to America. And he's staying here. Yay. No. He's going to move to Austin. Austin. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Peer pressure's kicking in, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome here. What, what do you, uh, Peter, I'm curious. You're, you're in touch with the normies more than most of us. Do you think, do you think this, this, uh, this Chinese, all these rumors about the Chinese mining issues, do you think that's like a mainstream concern by people or do you think it's just something that Bitcoiners are obsessed with? Uh, I think, I mean, in terms of this, I don't think anyone, the normies pay attention to it. They just see the price drops and they see Chinese miners are bad. It might be the first time they've heard about it and then they panic. Um, right. And do you think, so what about this whole like Elon narrative? Like this idea that Elon crashed the price because you attacked Elon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Let's talk about this. <laughs> do I you... mean, I think we've had, what, about four weeks of constant shit. I think you can just, I think there's enough to, sh to scare a few people. If you speak to Willy Wu, he was analyzing the coins that moved on to exchange. He said there were newer coins. Who are, you know, the class of fish he gave them, but do we believe in the on chain analytics stuff? I know you're not sure, are you? It kind of feels like TA, but the new TA. Yeah. Well, you could you could crash the price on BitMEX where no we're just purely derivatives, right? So yeah. how much what percentage of the Bitcoin volume is in derivatives and, and, and spot market, right? Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean if you look at the BitMEX volume, it's like fucking insane. I don't know. That's exactly my point though, right? Like head. Yeah, you know, even if you take like a traditional market like silver or gold, um, there's examples of people just buying all the silver futures and saying, yeah, I want to take delivery and the market just goes insane. But there's like, I, I mean, even more than that, like you see like the stats where they're like, uh, like Bitcoin days lost. Or like, like the sad stackers that have been accumulating during this period because like these addresses have, have been increasing under a Bitcoin, but in about this, like, who are these people that are reusing their addresses and sending them all to the same address? And like, like I know I'm not counting <laughs> <laughs> metrics. Like, is is it? I don't know. It's, it's I don't believe it. And 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 the exchanges. I mean, you see those things are like, oh, a whale went to Coinbase or an unknown whale went out or things like that. And and literally, Coinbase at any point in time can spin up a new address and send a bunch of funds that way. And what these analytic companies or these on-chain um, uh, you know, heuristic companies are doing. They're they're saying, oh, Coinbase just uh, a huge whale went out of Coinbase into a, an unknown address. And it's like literally, you don't know. You, yeah. That could be Coinbase. Right. That's the other stats. They're saying like more coins are leaving exchanges than ever before, no, right? I don't believe. But meanwhile, that. sailors buying them on Coinbase and then sending them to a custodial a custodial provider. Like, is that even like no. you can't tell on chain if that's happening? Unless Open Node has like all these exchanges, X pubs. I'm not going to ever look at any of that. Yeah, but even so, the thing that really moves the price is like leverage traders just getting liquidated right. and wrecked, right? Like that's what you see, like those cascading. They don't even leave the exchange ever. No, the, those bitcoins never even existed, right? It was just yeah. purely like derivatives, BitMEX, like uh, bucket shop style. I mean, we went from four to four thousand, sixty-four thousand in uh, a year, and um, I think some people would have been selling some very tasty. Uh, stacks of Bitcoin, and I think the market got shook out by a, a constant energy narrative. Um, it was a, a real boost in the market when Elon Musk uh, bought in and bought yeah, on 1.5 billion, and then said he was going to sell cars of Bitcoin. Uh, does a 180 and said he's not. He's going to blame coal, which sits alongside the energy narrative. It's a frothy market. There's a lot of leverage trades out there, um, and then we get hit with. China mining situation. I just think there was a lot of things happening that maybe spooked a few people. Some just thought, fuck, this is a good time to take some money off the table. Maybe buy a car or something. Yeah, but Bitcoin had such a solid like run up and there was all these leverage positions yeah. and they just got whacked and just wrecked. But right? the, wasn't wasn't the leverage drop from about thir under 38? Was it under 38 where it dipped down? That was where like the cascade, like right. wind down happened right. where it just within a very short amount of time, dipped down to like 24 and came back up. Well, like you like hunt, uh, you know, especially, you know, the professional traders, they yeah. like hunt the leverage guys. Cause you know, it's a very mental thing. So like, um, 
like a degen trader when they're like setting their liquidation price or whatever, they go, oh, well, it'll never fall below 40. So like, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna make my liquidation price, you know, like 38, you know, 900, right underneath where, where it is. And so they like go, they try and dip just below those big round numbers. And if they can hit, if they can hit like a bunch of big liquidations, then it just fucking cascades. And I, and a lot of times we have, I feel like we almost have more leverage in the system because you have, um, you have, you have like these loan providers that are also adding, uh, you know, th this, I this idea of, you know, taking out a loan on your Bitcoin and then, you know, can, maybe can like buying an Aston Martin <laughs> with it or something. Can you name a few? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good story. How do you that? The, the Aston Martin actually, it worked out. I can out. sell it and double my Bitcoin. It's worth more sats now, yes. Um. <laughs> but I do feel like there's there's like a more of a normalization of leverage, right? Like it used to be, it used to be, and maybe that's just because the market is more mature. Like no one uh, lectures someone for taking out leverage on their house, even though that's the majority of their net worth. Um, for most people is their house. No one, you know, you never hear someone at like the dinner table at Thanksgiving go like, you're super irresponsible. You took a mortgage out on your house in this, you know, super speculative market. So maybe it's because it's more mature, but it does feel like it's been normalized uh, more so than previous cycles. In previous cycles, you just knew you were a degen if you were trading on BitMEX. Like you knew kind of what you were getting into. It had a hundred X on it. The other thing is like, uh, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't any of this really matter because if you think about it, again, when we were sitting at four to six thousand last year, if someone had said, "Look, we'll be at twenty k within a year," you, everyone would have like, "Fuck, I'll take that." Yeah, exactly. We're at where, where we at? Like we're at thirty-eight thousand dollars right now, Bitcoin. That's fucking insane. The only people this matters to are the people who joined since Christmas. That's all that matters. But not if they were stacking. If they were just staying home and stacking sats, they're probably still up right now. Yeah, but I'm just saying it's like I haven't done the math. I would imagine everyone in this room is kind of okay. I mean, you know, welcome. I mean, I bought the top and everything, everything <laughs> in between. Bought the top and everything in between. I mean, I, yeah. Would you say it's a good thing, though, that all this leverage is being liquidated? Um, like, I mean, it, it, it sucks that um, maybe if normies have gotten into it and they've over leveraged, right? But um, it, 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 would you say it's a good thing that, you know, we, we crashed all the way down to like 30K or whatever? And we have all the we have all this leverage liquidating. Like I would think that's a good thing. It's, it's definitely a, a good thing. It's a healthy. It, it builds a healthy base, in my opinion. I think the most healthy, the most important thing is where is our floor? And it feels like our floor is thirty thousand at the moment. It feels like it really oh, you did it. You said there. it. You put it out there. <laughs> you curse us. Don't worry, guys. I don't want to say. But what I'm saying is, like, it feels like it's been struggling yeah. beyond so much. It's staying the first. It keeps bouncing back up. And now, I, I don't know anyone else, but that time we were ranging around 10,000, you know, up and down yeah. for months. It feels like we just, we're just in a range between- When the space cat just kept saying, you're never gonna- Well, that's how every market cycle goes over, yeah. right? You have like this huge run up, everyone's, you know, over liquidated, then they get wrecked, it just got crashes down. Die. No, I think no, I think we just got cut. I think we just our recording just cut. Oh. They we lost. lost can you guys. still hear us? Live chat, can you still hear us? Peter called the top and then we lost yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> everyone's sold. Yeah, everyone's out in the exchange right now. You know? <laughs> Camera's gone, Damn. but they can still hear us. What am I no vid. Damn. <laughs> We're working. We're working on it, freaks. We're working on it, but we know you can still hear us. Shit, I hope it's not Elon coming. On. <laughs> Live still on Twitch. You are back. Can hear. No video. No You're video. good. Yes. yes. Yeah. On Twitter. All right. We can hear you. Yes. Wait. No so video, try right? turning off the video and turning it back on again. Yeah. Let's give that a go. Um. We're working on it, freaks. Uh, while we're here, I mean, I think we can just keep talking because, you know, this is a bad. podcast and usually the show is audio only. Um, so it's not the worst thing in the world while Wiz figures this out. I mean, I think we we have millions of fucking Bitcoiners out there that are just stacking regardless of the price. Right. And like that's really the that's the ultimate signal. Uh, the signal isn't really, you know, the short term price movements. I mean, that's dominated as, as Wiz said, right? It's dominated by leverage trading and traders. Um, I think we should, 
should harass Elon out of town so everyone gets his Bitcoin. So he sells underwater and everyone gets his Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That would be oh, nice. Oh, where's that word? Harass that fucker. Keep hammering it until he sells. Sell pussy. Fucking sell. Yeah. Elon, you hear that? Peter's talking more shit. <laughs> By the way, the peanut gallery is telling you to speak up. I, okay. I should just lean forward. Yeah, I? just lean forward. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Does anyone want some? This is great. Yeah, you know what? Oh, yeah. I'll have some. Let's, yeah, let's we're, get we're some rum and whiskey uh, here. I, I, I just had. Uh, I really enjoyed my Kablawi cocktail. You know, watch it. Oh, uh, yeah. Incredible Kablawi. Amazing yeah, cocktail artist. Three. Ben, I know it's... No, okay. Got some extra cups. Uh, What's more? Does mm. it happen? Just Man, nice. all right, fine, fine. Here, you don't have to drink it all. All right, okay. Oh, Three, that's what they always restart say. Restart the stream. Tune back in in a second. Oh. Experiencing some technical difficulties here at Citadel yeah. Dispatch. I mean... I know these are for sure, but I'm taking one of these. What's that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Those are sexy. I'm the no, for you. I know you asked for one. Yeah, but that? Yeah. yeah, I got them upstairs. Sure. Yeah, Make cool. sure you grab some uh, stickers too. We got them on the side over there. No, I brought three guys from there right now. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Yeah, guys, just don't say your seed phrases out loud. Everyone's oh, okay. listening, okay? Just be careful. Anyway, it's all on Bitcoin is stored at. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Thank you, freaks, for standing by while we handle those technical difficulties. Uh, we're gonna blame Pete. Uh, he left. He seems to leave the room because he knew he knew it was his fault. So, um, where do we stand right now? We were talking about Pete called the bottom. Um, uh, we're we have a stacking floor. Stackers uh, set the floor. Don't forget stackers that. Stackers do set the fucking floor. No, I'm good. What I what I think is like I mean. If, if we just keep stacking, there's like the sky's the limit, right? Like, how can you stop that? We can't fail. Literally Imagine shorting fail. that. Yeah, no, everyone's selling and then we're all picking, we're all picking up from 30K, right? So we're all buying, so we're set the floor. Oh, yeah. Yes, that is whiz. <laughs> um, yeah, so so freaks, we can see the live chat. Uh, we have it up on TV, up on the TV. So not only can we see it, but our our wonderful in person audience here can can see it as well. Yeah, you guys uh, talk about Taleb. Fraud. Like Twenty people here. Right. So we have Taleb speaking at the BSV shit. Right. I don't really think that's. I mean, he can go fuck himself. And Noriel's yeah, Noriel's there like too. You oh yeah. Him? Is he have you blocked? He unblocked. Me. He has me blocked. So he retweeted yeah. me saying I put Bitcoin as an intelligence test. Talib failed. He retweeted me and insulting me. And so that's actually, like, I said, well, come on, debate me. Um, and then he just insulted me again, called me a, I shouldn't know my place and some other shit. <laughs> I was like, I'm, like, I'm a slam dunk if you, uh, if you want to debate. If you think you're so smart, go for it. But you know, it's just another fucking idiot. So, yeah. I mean, fuck him. I mean, that that was like it was amazing how quick that turned, right? Yeah, like, the, irony, I mean, was a, the irony. Do you guys know irony means? He wrote the forward to the fucking <laughs> Bitcoin standard. <laughs> well, no, it's not just that. He is anti-fragile and he's fragile as fuck. I think that's, I think that's what got me blocked. <laughs> yeah. I think I made an anti-fragile joke. And then if you see a fraud, don't say fraud. You're a fraud, and he's going to a fucking BSV conference. It's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, he's hilarious. literally on the same page as fucking. I, I gave it like two, two months stop until he has a lawsuit with, with Craig Wright and all that. I mean, for sure they'll go up in, in a lawsuit. Like these guys sue every, everybody they worked with ever. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. They're suing uh, the, the BSV devs. Yeah. yeah. So they're suing anyone. Yeah. Would you I, I give like, it two months until they suit all The BSV devs is like a fake, right? I, I don't think so. I don't think It's so. just to like cover their. They're, we're suing everyone, kind of thing. Right? I have no idea, actually. Who knows? What are, they, anyways, what are they even working on over there? I don't even are like, they like the, about the Dogecoin it. devs. Like, what, <laughs> what innovations happening over there? I mean, yeah, I don't want to talk about, about it. Do we have a better topic to talk about? What else? Are you? Uh, How about the conference? We can talk about the conference. Hell yeah! Yeah. 
Um, I mean, a bunch of the guys here are going to be participating in the Open Source Dome, um, which I'm pretty excited about. What's the Open Source Dome? The Open Source Dome is right next to the massive outdoor bar. Um, That's why I'm hanging out. And uh, it's a fucking stacked <laughs> lineup, and it's open source projects only. Um, 95% of them are are, are are true false projects, free open source projects. Um, Drama. Oh, man. A couple of them have restrictive licenses. Uh, but I think uh, I think it's important that uh, we have these open discussions. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, drink-fueled, in-person, open source dome license debates, which, you know, sounds like a lot of fun to me. Are we going to have an open source boxing match too? Gonna it's going to be like a UFC weigh-in, you know, and they're just going <laughs> to... We're gonna have we're gonna have two devs just on, on the stage just talking shit to each other. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, Wiz, you got a dope ass booth uh, from for Mempool Space and uh, well, Mempool and Bisc. Yeah, the, the conference organizers are really um, amazing. They gave us like the best booth, and we uh, split it 50-50 for Bisc and Mempool. So we're gonna be giving away some really cool T-shirts um, as thank you gifts to our sponsors. So. Even if you donate any amount to the Mempool site, you can get a really cool set of t-shirts, biscuit Mempool. And uh, stop by and say hi and, and meet everyone. We'll be there. We're gonna have Ron Paul open the fucking conference. That's fucking yeah. cool. Let's go. Um, I feel like Miami's just, it feels, there feels like a lot of energy here right yeah. now. Yeah, a lot of energy. Um, I feel the energy shifting. I feel like we're at 200K. You feeling yeah. it? Yeah. That's the first step, you yeah. know? Everything under 200k is a gift. Did you mean yeah, US sure. dollars or like Japanese yen? 200k sats per <laughs> plate. Um, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll try and save face. No, I meant dollars, obviously. Um, yeah, so I mean, anything else you guys specifically excited about with this week? We have Beef Steak. Beef Steak. Beef, beef Steak yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Beef Steak Man himself is staying at the Citadel. I think he's shopping for Beef Steak still. Yeah. I was hoping we'd have him on for I the know. episode, yeah, he's, but uh, he's a busy guy. He's trying to make sure this is the yeah. best event. If we keep filibuster, filibustering, then, you know, as, as, if we can make this if we make uh, this extend, then maybe he'll join us for the, the tail end. He'll just walk in with a bunch of meat and just join the conversation. <laughs> we just sandbag and drag him on the couch. Yeah, it could happen. It could yeah, happen. Let's we'll we'll see an interview in Jack Dorsey, which I think is going to be. Fun. That, that's fire. probably going to be the best really talk at the conference, yeah. Really good match. Is that on the first day? Don't know. Yes. Don't know. Yeah, I think that's a really good matchup. Uh, at I'm noon, hoping for big things from Jack Dorsey. Yeah, Dorsey. yeah and, 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 and on that topic, like HRF just donated like 200K. I yeah. think 210K. Yeah. Unbelievable. What's really yeah, interesting is the smallest grant they provided was a 10K grant. And they provided this guy and Open Arms and Fontaine a fully noted one Bitcoin each grant at 10K. Ooh. And that was like a big deal at the time. That was, you know, what was it, eight months ago or something like that, seven months ago. Their grant, 6X to the half. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was great though. And I didn't I, know about that, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you HRF, thank you Gladstein. Sucks that you sold it though. <laughs> <laughs> Put a lot into the bounties, but hey, we got some things done. I'm really happy about how that turned out, so. We have Bitcoin and Books asking about any huge announcements of the conference. Literally, the, so the big trend with conferences in general is that if anyone has any kind of announcement to make um, over the last couple of months, they hold it for the conference usually, um, so they can try and get that extra publicity boost. Um, so yeah, there there is a shit ton of, of, of announcements that I've heard of already, and I expect even more to happen. Um, I mean, I, they're all very bullish, but I'm just a fucking broken record at this point. Uh, so, uh, so that that's always exciting. I think we have we have Zabo's going to be speaking. He hasn't, you know, he's been pretty quiet this year. I don't know. I maybe got censored on Twitter or not, but I haven't really heard from him lately. He's so. definitely shadow banned. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like pretty excited for the Zabo talk. Yeah, what about the other events, like other than the actual conference? Like, what about the satellite events and dinners and parties? Uh, the, um, there's, a, there's a pleb party yeah. on Thursday. Oh, pleb dinner, right? Yeah. yeah. Was that Thursday? Pleb night. Pleb night. Pleb night. Pleb night. I think yeah, it competes with night. whale night. It's whale night versus pleb night. It's the same time as yours, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I don't think that's why I didn't get involved. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, they have a, anyone can buy a ticket. They have a BTC pay service set up.
everything. So. <laughs> and I was like, I'm getting a good deal. I'm going to lock it in now. You know, <laughs> but I just got that one completely wrong. Um, so it might, might surprise you, but I've never considered about SaaS providing the transaction. Never. Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good. <laughs> so you just press send on the, on the app. Just press some, I mean, one of my wallets has like a low, medium. And high yeah, what do you fee. click? Uh, almost always high. You almost always took the high fee. Yeah, I want I, it now. I'm never doing like transactions with less than like a thousand dollars, really. <laughs> Not because I'm a baller, it's just it's there's nothing ball. to send. No, no, <laughs> it's usually paying someone yeah. through work or getting paid. I don't buy something for like sixty dollars on Bitcoin. So I just hit send, and, uh, and and it won't surprise you that the whole idea of our sats for bytes. Well, how, how many fucking bytes is my how, how am I meant to know this? And then can't, I just can't be bothered. It's just for me, it's a waste of time. It's my thing says oh, it'll be ten bucks or thirty bucks. Just go. I just don't care. I would imagine. In, uh, in, in my world, the, the kind of people I, I talk to about Bitcoin, they're probably very similar. Well, the Blue Wallet team was talking about this the other day because it's kind of interesting to me. Um, like, who is doing the medium? Like, who is, who is like, oh, I, I'm willing to wait eight hours or nine hours for a confirmation? I feel like it's, there's like a, there's very much an extreme. Yeah. So the way I look at it is, it, I, I like wallets that show low, medium, or high, but then also give you the actual number of sats provided. Yeah. So I will select medium. If I look on mempool and I will see, um, okay, medium is, is going to be like six sats or whatever, and, and I'll select medium then. Um, but you're exactly right. I think either people are going to select high or people are going to select low. Um, I know um, uh, from working in the industry, it's, it's a pain in the ass in the custodial sense of allowing these multiple structures because then if you allow low, then it's like you're going to get so many customer support issues of people saying, okay, well, my transaction didn't go through. What can I really do about this? I'm like, well, you paid for a low fee and then so what, you know, we'll have to build in support to be able to allow the user to bump it. There's all kinds of like issues then. So like I, I kind of agree, like high is the option and I look up mempool that space and I see that it's, it's gonna be good enough, I'll select high or medium or whatever. But low low is just a liability, <laughs> I think, yeah. for customer support issues and it's just a pain in the ass. Okay, question, Pete, how high do the fees have to be for you to actually care? Care about what though? Setting the, the fees, you know, and not, not getting it in instantly. Like how high a fee is your wallet going to have to be flashing for you to I just like, think it depends on the transaction. If I'm sending a hundred grand, hundred dollar fees. Gotcha. Okay, it doesn't matter if I was sending a thousand and it was hundred dollar fee. I'd be like, oh, okay. I'll just send you a thousand dollars, whatever it is, like on PayPal or something. What about yeah. Lightning though? I mean, will you ever, will you ever send that thousand over Lightning and set? Do you ever use Lightning? Yeah, I did. I was using it in El Salvador. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're using a lot of Satoshi down there. Cups of coffee with it. Yeah, it's awesome. um, I've incredible the down there. and coffees with it, uh, and it was really cool actually. It wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just because I, um, I wanted to just use my wallet for the novelty of uh, down there. I, I had blue wallet. It was actually because I ran out of dollars, and in El Zonte there isn't a cash <laughs> machine, so I ran out of dollars. I was like, okay, I'll just use this, and actually I don't even need to think about going to a cash machine. The only time I had to, I had to get some money. That, the last day for my flights, we went to the next town. But no, I was spending uh, Bitcoin the whole time there. Uh, I mean, I say the whole time, I probably did like five to 10 transactions. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that's because most of the time Jack was using Strike, so I didn't have to. But yeah, it was great. It was awesome. It was brilliant. Just every time it worked. I mean, I don't know if it's because I was using Blue Wallet and it's custodial. It is custodial. Yeah. Yeah. But every time it just worked, it was instant. It was great. It was awesome. It was awesome to leave SATs there. It was awesome to use Lightning. Um, but at the same time, my unit account is still dollars. So I want the price in dollars and I'll just send you the sats. And I yeah. have no idea what the transaction fee by skew. So they were showing you the price in dollars well, like, when you bought the coffee. They don't have the price in the sats on the wall. Right, what is the price in the dollars? Price, the price is, so the, say the price of coffee was, I don't know, $2. Or is it pesos? Is there, is no, no, there they're, they're dollarized in oh, okay. So say, say they're showing in dollars and then it just, they flash it up on my phone and I know I'm spending $2 off mm. Bitcoin. Right. But I always, I don't use. Bitcoin. You don't think in sats? No, I don't, because it's too volatile. It reminds yeah. me of when I was in Venezuela, when you went into the restaurant on the menu, all the prices were stickers, because they constantly have to reprice it. Yeah. Bitcoin's the same. It's like, I'm always having to reprice it. I just, I can't be fucked. Sorry, sorry. I'm a cuck. 
No, no, you can swear on this show. <laughs> I'm the same way. I, I no, I'm not apologizing for swearing. I'm apologizing for not being a... Not pricing things in SATs in your head. SATs are in your unit account. If SATs are in your unit account, you're short Bitcoin. Now, now the merchants uh, down there, were, were they? Were there a few of them that were at least preferring you pay? Oh, no, they wanted Bitcoin. They all wanted they Bitcoin. They wanted Bitcoin. Yeah, but they were in a bull run. We could that out. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so I, I had my back seen to, and she was, uh, I went to pay, and she, goes, and she said, will you pay in Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. Oh. No. <laughs> that was when I had dollars in the start. But no, they all wanted Bitcoin. And, and the thing was, it was, 18 months between the first time I went and now, and like everywhere it says pay with Bitcoin. Everywhere. It's, it's crazy. That's are those incredible. shops I'm using their own them. like um, self custody wallets or are they all using custodial wallets? Uh, no, so they're, it's, they're like, using custodial it's actually really cool because they're using their wallets. own custodial wallet. So it's an El Zante custodial wallet oh, yeah. that's, that's being run by Bitcoin Beach, which oh. is kind of a cool model that I feel like Bitcoiners don't really. Um, it's like address that channel. often. Yeah, so, it's so like it's an L&D hub that someone uh, essentially. The channels and mount. The I mean, they have an app. They have an app that anyone can download. We could use the custodial wallet if we want to, mm-hmm. but it's run by by a team that's in El Salvador. Oh, it's a dedicated app and not just use it. Like, the it's a Bitcoin Beach custodial wallet, okay, cool. and that way they have really good UX, but they don't have to trust uh, you know a foreign company with it. But the, the really cool thing about it is it's all, all the places except in Bitcoin in the app locally mm. and what you can see now is like it's not just El Zonte there's a few places up the coast and there's two or three places in San Salvador now accepting it and you can just see that seed is growing it's, it's really interesting That's so how long are you down there for we should just do a big shout out to Michael Peterson who 100%. literally built that whole thing himself and dragged people down there to help him it's it is the the Bitcoin dream that everyone talks about they're actually doing it there Incredible. Shout out to them. Yeah. We love to hear that. And we have we, love to, we yeah. have Deloy Money, who is I, I I'm blanking on the, the lead the lead maintainer of it, but that's the that's the custodial wallet. He'll be presenting in the Fall Stone at uh, at Bitcoin Sweet. 2021. So I'm pretty excited to meet him there. Um, and he's open sourcing the wallet. So that's what he he's open sourcing it before he walks into the Fall Stone. I, I think it's such agreement. an important topic, and, 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 and Peter, you were just down there. Um, I, I wanted to ask, what's the number one thing you've learned since being down there and seeing this whole circular economy of people using it, especially people that need to use it in that iconic case? Oh, that's a good question. Number one thing I learned. Um, hmm. uh, education is just key. Yeah. Education. I think it's all well and good going somewhere and like uh, El Zonte is teaching people about Bitcoin, but I actually think you've got to teach them about volatility because what we saw over the last week would have fucked some people if they'd have held everything in Bitcoin, like absolutely fucked them. Yeah. But they are teaching them about volatility. They are teaching them that they need to sell some of their Bitcoin back into dollars and hold some savings and treat the savings as a long-term... Uh, but do they have account. access to do that? Yeah. What they're actually doing, what most people are doing now, they've got the Bitcoin Beach app for their Bitcoin, and they've got the Strike app for their dollars, and they're moving between the two, I think. Interesting. But Strike doesn't have banking relationships down there, I thought. I, yeah. I don't know the details. So, so they're not going back to the local currency, they're putting it into dollars on Strike. El Salvador doesn't percent. have a local currency. Well, you said. The local currency is the dollar. They're a dollarized country. Okay, gotcha. So everyone uses the dollar. But the important thing about that is, as uh, um, yeah. Biden prints another whatever six trillion dollars, right. <laughs> they don't see that. They don't. They see that. They don't get stimulus checks. Yeah. So they get funds. Yeah, awesome. um, also, the the really interesting thing is what Jack's actually doing with Strike. Uh, he's completely changing remittance there, uh, where before you have to go to get a bus and go to Western Union, and you know you get a haircut on the price. You can stack. He sat on your couch. He sent dollars from the U.S. via Strike. There's no haircut, it's instant and it's free. You don't have to travel, but you can also send small amounts. So before there's like a minimum fee. So if you send them $50, you might be losing a large chunk. Damn. But now you can send $5. The kid can say, I need $5 for X and they can get it. Yeah. It's really, really amazing. But that's why you mentioned like the volatility as being a concern. I mean, they're dollarized, but I mean, if you're in a Venezuela, right? They're already used to having not even volatility. I mean, it's just down. Just the, the currency just loses value, right? Um, Sorry, just to answer your question, the most important thing I learned is actually 
going to these places and seeing, see, actually seeing it and understanding it. But my, my point is, is like the fee, the fees are almost, that can fuck them even more, right? Like if that's why I think lightning is so important, right? Because if they're hitting the chain and all of a sudden, you know, a difficulty adjustment goes goes up double digits and then we have a massive mempool and they need to, you know, buy food to eat and they have to pay a huge on-chain fee, they can't just click the high fee button, right? They're all using lightning. Yeah, they have to because yeah, they're all using lightning. Because the small amounts, even even in one sack per byte fee market, at current Bitcoin prices, you know that's it's eating up a significant amount. But are they all using that custodial lightning? Like nobody's running their own Raspberry Pi kind of thing. I mean, I don't think I'm, the places I went, I don't think so. And and one of the other things, like some people are accepting Bitcoin because there's people wanting to pay it, and it's just a form of money to them. They're not really into it, like one of the papooses. Right. There's other people who, like naturally with Bitcoin, have spent the time understand it. The guy running the coffee shop, he gets it. Like he just gets it. He wants your Bitcoin. So it's, it's like everywhere you go, there's a range of people who are really into it, a range of people who aren't. Just using it as a payment method. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Nice. It's really awesome to hear. It would yeah. be a shame though, like if one of those custodial apps, uh, you know, got hacked or had some kind of issues, right? That's the real concern is that, okay, great. Everyone's using, Bitcoin, but are they really if they're just using this custodial app? Well, but that's what I think what's great about Bitcoin Beach is if they are do, doing the custodial themselves and they're going the Uncle Jim model, right. there is at least someone that hold uh, accountable and you can actually go visit them and, and you don't know, have you know, any issue with. So I love the Uncle Jim model and being able to onboard your friends or even a re whole entire region. Um, so I, I like that approach as, as opposed to like a custodial in some other country that you really don't have any recourse yeah, yeah. there's no accountability yeah. there exactly well, the these people grid. aren't going to be running lightning nodes right is that yeah, yeah for sure i think eventually when it's just an app on your phone then they can yes of course That's but it. they're not going to like the raspberry pi is just like kind of like a stepping stone right yeah, even so, even if you do have a neutrino yeah. node, there's still the challenges of liquidity. Like this is yeah. like a, still a True. very difficult True. problem that we're working through. So I think it's a little more complicated than just the availability of the software. I think the important thing is that people are starting to use Lightning, even if it is custodial yeah. to begin with. Like it's at least a stepping stone. I think that is really the stepping stone yeah. as opposed to running your own node. Yeah, and, and the, fa the, and the fact that if they do want to go and run their own node, that one day they could say, okay, I'll just generate an invoice and I'm out of the yeah. system in like, you know, a second. Yeah. So that's what's really important, having the option to exit. Exactly. Well, they're getting the inflation resistant properties of Bitcoin, but they're not getting the seizure resistance properties of Bitcoin, right? And that's the risk or the remain, remaining risk. So, yeah. That's kind of how the internet started too, like with ISPs um, in all these uh, regional places, like the first ISP to start in that little town, and then everyone's just connecting to their servers and that's how they connect to the internet. And then soon, you know, um, there's huge wireless telecoms where everyone has the internet, but we're not there yet, right? It'll be interesting to see how the lightning model develops. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think right now you just have to get people used to the like the the muscle memory or like just being able to like pay for things using Bitcoin, you know, using lightning. Yeah, yeah, just like being able to yeah. recognize the lightning invoice flow. Like, how like this is it? a lightning invoice, you know, I can scan it, pull it up on my phone yeah. and pay it out. So yeah, that's a huge step in yeah. itself. And then the technology will catch up. Another thing, just to add to your question, yeah. I think uh, kind of like as a wider point, because I've traveled a lot with this, mm -hmm. is that uh, how people use Bitcoin or what their need for Bitcoin is really geography dependent, really geography dependent. And I think sometimes we think of Bitcoin as, uh, as fairly comfortable Westerners and don't always think about like the scenarios that people are living in, in places like this. So for example, some people live in a, one room shack. Yeah, yeah. If they're gonna if they're gonna back up the private keys, they're not gonna set up a multi sig and have one in a safety deposit is here. And you know, there's scenarios like that you have to think about. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is that if you want to be the ultimate sovereign Bitcoiner, there's a cost to that, and, and we can't be shaming people for not going through all the lengths of not having their own nodes or, or not like custodying it themselves. Like, there's levels to it, and what's important is that they have a path. To get there and to be able to do it and that we keep it you know within reach 
um, you know, there's always going to be people outside of that a threshold that just can't do it. And, and we or don't just, even know to do it. That's the thing. Like people don't know. Again, back to the education yeah. thing. That's a huge part they of it as well. They don't know. Yeah. yeah. Where do they get their education now? Is it just peer to peer? Like where not? No, Bitcoin Beach now has this uh, place called Hope House, this whole building. They have teachers in there, they really? have educational sessions, they spend time with them. They, they, also, the people are spreading the knowledge to each other as well. So it's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, I'm saying to Michael, he should organize an event. Let's try and get a load of this down there because it's just really interesting to see. It's worth the journey. That's sweet. Should we brush up on our Spanish and do a workshop down there? I really want to go. I mean, it's super inspirational. We're oh, fucking killing it. What's the credit help out? Um, in your opinion. Um, hmm, good question. Uh, well, you can always do donate to the project. I mean, the project is charity based. It, it, you know, Michael's a, a missionary, and he went down there to help people. And you know, the money is originally to get to give to kids, to get them out of gangs, and give them jobs, cleaning up the streets, and uh, lifeguarding for the uh, surfers, etc. I mean, it, re it relies on a certain amount of money going in. To, to kind of kickstart it. And then people like us going down there, leaving SATs. I mean, I probably left $100 in SATs, but that then circulates around the system. Uh, the more people go down that, the better. Um, I think, I don't know what, what else more you can do. Uh, yeah. I mean, people like you, you guys are the smartest guys in the room usually. Reach out to Michael and say, how can we help? Because Tell you. He, he might have a whole bunch of things that, that, he asked me to help with publicity because that's the one thing I do. But he might turn around to you and say, I need tech support. I need help with, you know, we've got a problem on our wallet. I don't know, but I can connect him with any of you. But so specifically they have, they had this, you know, world-class surfer, Katie Diaz, who just recently tragically died in a lightning incident while she was surfing in a storm. Um, so they're raising a bunch of money right now to do a Olympic surfing facility for the El Salvador team. And they're raising that all on Bitcoin. So that's Katie Diaz surf.com. Uh, so consider donating to that in Bitcoin. What? They already hit the target. They hit the yes. target. Yeah. Big shout out to Miles Suter who totally yes. led that. True. Let's fucking go. Yeah. Miles is here too. I'm looking forward to seeing him while we're here. Um, I love that dude. Um, the other thing about lightning is, you know, the channels are kind of confusing to people. And that's what's nice about the custodial wallet is that you don't have to deal with the channel management. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you don't have to deal with confirmations, which goes back to our previous discussion, is like a really, really benefit to new corners and fresh corners. Because this idea of understanding how confirmations work is like, it's a real, it's not a natural, it's not a natural thing uh for uh, people to comprehend like uh, and i mean you could tell them oh well you know like your credit card doesn't settle for blah 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 months like they don't give a shit you know to them like when yeah, they pay yeah. it's done that's all that's behind like, the scenes you know right, like they're exactly, not yeah. experiencing the effects of that firsthand yeah the businesses i mean as it's coming from a custodial that deals with fiat like it's a fucking pain in the ass yeah. having to deal with this this the currency that settles in like six blocks right and 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 onboarding people on currencies that may not even settle for like 365 days, right? I mean, technically you can reverse transactions for so an ungodly amount of time. So like from a business standpoint, it's, it's a kind of a pain in the ass and that from like exchanges and custodials that deal with fiat, it's, it's terrible. But on the Bitcoin side, it's amazing. I mean, that's one of the things that I loved about beginning my journey through like lightning development is that incident, like so, you know, I, I, I get an invoice, I get a receive, and boom, it's done. I don't ever have to worry about remittances. I don't ever have to worry about the first transactions. It's just done. It's a 10x yeah. improvement. It's amazing. Can we uh, fit another dude on this couch? <laughs> yeah, we got an owl. No, no, can we fit another dude on this couch? <laughs> we got an owl, trying, <laughs> owl trying to gender shame us up here. And then we also have uh, a Satoshi a Justice point. Warrior over here. <laughs> we have a, 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 a very friendly freak there, Sam, cucking for custodial wallets in the chat. <laughs> Um, I want to be absolutely clear. I mean, obviously not your keys, not your coins. Um, I think that one of the cool parts about Lightning is this idea of interoperable custodial wallets. And I've talked about this a lot on Dispatch in the past. Now, the, the concern is I don't think Blue Wallet and Wallet of Satoshi and other first world large mainstream custodial wallets will last. They never do. Sure. They always get forced to add KYC. And the second they add KYC, they're fucking done. I mean, we saw that happen with bottle pay. Like it's, it's 
it's it's a it's a story as old as Bitcoin. It's been happening through, since the beginning of fucking Bitcoin. Um, the 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 thing is though, what's really cool about Bitcoin Beach is I could see this like kind of extrapolated Uncle Jim type of model with small towns. Uh, that's a lot harder for you know regulators. Basically, the reason we don't have all these different custodial wallets competing with each other is because of regulators. And it feels like. Um, if you have like a small town in El Salvador using a custodial wallet, that's way different than Blue Wallet servicing millions of customers, uh, presumably in the future, right? And I, I feel like there's a strong distinction there. Um, well, there's some trade-offs, right? Like you can use um, Phoenix Wallet, which has a kind of channel opening service, right? So you get that uh, kind of custodial or self-custody um, security, but they they give you the liquidity, right? And there's other wallets. Um, it was like Breeze or, or, or a number of others that do similar things. So maybe that's the, the Goldilocks level of, um, you know, smooth user experience, but still uh, some kind of self-custody. I think the, uh, the El Salvador model works well. When you just use this. Sure. This is how it works when you say Breeze and Phoenix and Blue. Like, you know, I even like all Y and I download them all. What's different? Well, this one does X for you. Most of the time, I'm just kind of like, and I, I think I think there's like a circle of people who work on Bitcoin and code stuff who understand this stuff and it all comes natural to you. And then there's a circle of people on the outside of like, huh? And they they buy on Coinbase or they send to a wallet and suddenly they don't realize they fucked up their KYC forever. And so uh, I'm not really, I don't know what the point I'm trying to make is. Well, I mean, people, saying, people still use a like cash app, Venmo, all these other yeah. you know, stupid. Yeah, I, I think, I think and Matt's going to hate me saying this. We argue about this every new year. But um, I think the effort required to get perfect privacy is it's beyond 99.9%. Well, I don't want perfect privacy. I just want not horrible privacy. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but also uh, I, think, I think a lot of people just like they've got Facebook, yeah. they use Google, they, they just accept that they're in a world where like... I feel like you're on the same page as uh, Bitcoin influencer Dieter Bob. I'm not <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, but so I just think some people have come to like that and, and, and it, they've kind of accepted it. I think some people like Matt are in it for a whole bunch of reasons. And, you know, uh, the, the, the no inflation, the privacy, blah, blah, blah. I think some people are just in it. Yeah. But if you ever use iMessage? Yeah, I've used iMessage. So iMessage is encrypted, okay. right? But you don't use it for encryption, right? right? Mm -hmm. you've, you, you've, you've gotten a product that is has a great UX, that's easy for you to use, and is significantly better than if you sent a plain text message. I didn't know right? how encryption. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's what I want for Bitcoin. What I'm saying, what like, what I want for Bitcoin is I don't want the average person to to be thinking that they need to be more private. I mean, I hope that they do, but I I'm not I'm not expecting that. What I want is wallet teams and service providers to care about privacy best practices when they're building these projects, right? I mean, I think what Apple is doing is interesting. They're making they're bringing up uh, privacy to 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 a lot of what they build let him to really think about it i mean the, the, like that neat little thing, feature now you can sign up to uh, an, app, an app with apple and it just says hide your email address things like that make it super easy for people um i just think yeah it has to be baked in i mean they, they have the best culture. ux people on the fucking planet yeah you know uh, i mean we'll get there but it's it's going to be a slog I think we're starting to see it. I know, like, I just came out with that whole, like, privacy lightning article, and then Moon Vault was, like, one of the great examples of, it, it kind of provides the same UX that, like, Moon or, or, sorry, Phoenix or Breeze provides, but it has a lot of privacy um, baked into it, which which I love. And it can always be more, and then there's, um, you know, even Ben today, we were talking about, like, you know, yeah. like examples of trying to better the lightning privacy space, but I think, I think you're exactly right. It's that we can try to bake it in from the very start, and and to have that great user experience. But the user doesn't even need to worry about the privacy because the, the application is. It's, it's it's making sure that users are the best protected as they can be. So that way, when censorship resistance needs to be a thing, it's already baked in. Right, and like part of it is like, so I used iMessage as an example, but they're using like. 
their own like proprietary encryption that's like kind of questionable and security they're 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 backing up all of their uh messages to their cloud and not that's encrypting them end to end in the cloud so if if you have the default set up then that's like a back door into all those conversations um but it's obviously a clear step in the right direction and i think that that shows you where you, you kind of need the hardcores to keep those companies honest, even if the average user doesn't really care about it, right? You need the hardcores. We just got Mr. Beefsteak just walked into the room. Hey. Um, you need them to keep keep them honest, right? Otherwise, they'll just default to, they just won't be honest, right? Like if you don't have hardcores keeping them honest, they're just gonna fucking pretend they're, they're private when they're not as private as they could be. Yeah. But, but I think it is right. Like not everyone cares about privacy, right? No like, one cares okay. about privacy. Yeah. Overwhelming. That's not. That's yeah. not like well, a profound point. No, well, that's like no, the, no, no, no. is that I, the case? I think, though? I think. I think people care about it. You ask them if you want privacy or not. They want it, but the their ability to achieve it is really hard. So you can go and read Lop's explanation. It's like, fuck. How do I live my life? Yeah. You know yeah. how. how you know, yeah. So it's and I. Just, that's a straw man. Well, but I think I think the higher priority is to have that savings mechanism, and, and their, their dollar is deflating, and they need to have this savings mechanism. So if you have to sacrifice a little bit of privacy for a better um, living, then then what what do you you know? I just think there's different tiers of user and different categories of user. Yeah. Uh, and and, and you know, you you all and me included, this is our job, right? We do this all day, every day, so we can spend all day talking to the smartest people. Reading their articles, listening to podcasts, watching videos, you know. and if you're working on it, you know, someone like yourself, then you're deep in the weeds of this stuff. Now, if we're thinking of the normal normal person, they've got a different job that they're doing all day, every day, which they're having conversations about. Maybe they've got an hour or two a day to read an article or listen to a podcast. They sometimes not everyone has. Now, some will before people start shouting at me. Some will spend the time. Mm -hmm. I just think the vast majority aren't going to they're going to come into bitcoin for gains some a percentage will spend a lot of time going down the rabbit hole running nodes etc etc but some will just come in for the gains they'll buy an exchange they maybe will buy a hardware wallet and that's as far as they're going to go well it's it's kind of um all, all of these security privacy things are similar right if i uh if i chain you to the boat and i whip you and i say you gotta whip, you gotta row the boat you know that you're a slave right but if I give you, if I pay your salary in uh, fiat money, and I can print out as much fiat money as I want, then maybe you don't realize that you're a slave. And um, if even if you live in a developed country where you're getting paid like USD, and you think, oh, the inflation's not so bad, well, then the IRS subpoenas Coinbase or any of these KYC things and charges you taxes, right? So there's, like you said, it's like different tiers of uh, different threat models. Maybe is the right word. For well, privacy is a part of the conversation in El Salvador. Right, because they're all inflating so bad, everybody is getting robbed blind. Concern. So who cares about privacy because my fiat money is going to lose like half It's probably part of the conversation in Venezuela or Iran or maybe or Russia. Yeah, maybe. And then, and then that's that point where geography changes your use of Bitcoin. You know, in Iran, certainly privacy is more well, important. But, but it's, you see this yeah. with other technologies too, like VPNs, for example, right? VPN is totally different use case for people in different countries. If you live in China, uh, a VPN is about censorship resistance. But if you live in like US, a VPN is like, oh, I just want to watch a different Netflix uh, catalog from a different show. Yeah. So it's it's like a you know access versus censorship, right? And maybe some countries um, they're they don't censor the internet except for like Facebook and maybe a few apps. So for them, it's also like a, a freedom or censorship resistant thing, but. Yeah, any of these uh, technologies like Tor, VPN, or Bitcoin even, or have totally different use cases for people that live in totally different uh, threat models. Yeah, that's a great point. What I like mentioning, like with, with Iran is specifically, is, and, and the Lightning Network is, and you with the Lightning Network, you got two choices. You can run an IP-based node, you can run a Tor-based node. And if you're from Iran and you have an Iran IP, a lot of True. services yeah. and, and things will, 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 will censor you and run more and allow um, you to even access the internet in their country. So like having that IP based node is, is a liability. So like, that's where I think like, especially if you're from Iran, like privacy should be an important thing. And then 
if you're using Lightning Network, I definitely use Tor or, or like a VPN because then you're just, otherwise, you know, you could get censored in the future. Well, I mean, I think a lot of this is just because of how early we are. Um, you know, PayPal doesn't want to block users from spending on PayPal. Like if, pay, if, if it was up to PayPal, you could send to anyone anywhere with limited KYC, as little friction as possible, as low fees as possible, have you completely captured in their system and, and have very little restrictions, but they're forced and compelled to. So enter Bitcoin, right? And the whole value of Bitcoin is that you're able to make the transactions that you're not allowed to make otherwise. And, and that means that Bitcoin itself, you're, you're paying for this censorship resistance. You're paying for this ability to make this transaction that will be more expensive and more difficult to make than a centralized option that might censor you in that given transaction type. And I think we just haven't, like if, if regulators just decide that they're gonna just completely change the way they've acted for the last 50 years, 100 years, then you know you don't need transactional privacy on Bitcoin. You don't need censorship resistance on Bitcoin at all. We don't even need Bitcoin. You could just use Tron or you could use some fucking shit coin. You could use USDC with you know Coinbase and you can just transfer it to El Salvador or wherever you want to transfer it. But what's going to happen is regulators are going to come in and they're going to figure out how this stuff starts working and they're going to start hitting people. And it's, it's and, and they're going to make examples of people and they're going to block certain transaction types. And at that point, people are going to have to step up or shut up. Look who it is. We got B Steak right. Josh in the house. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Making our ratio even better. <laughs> How'd the shopping go? Brutal. Are you excited? Are you excited? Very Weird excited. Bob. <laughs> I'm kind of hungry now. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> so this is the biggest beef steak you've run yet, right? It is. And what's the attendance roughly, can you say? Probably 150 ish. Nice. Legit. 150. Yeah. So it's like almost 500 pounds of beef. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> It really is all you can eat. This will be my first beef steak. I'm excited. I'm you're for a treat, Hell man. Yeah, man. Awesome. yeah so once I, you go to your I, first I, time, you're I stayed you're online. Right. I was refreshing <laughs> that button on your web page. <laughs> <laughs> I've never made a faster lightning payment in my life. It was great. It's, it's amazing. Don't, don't eat all day. Like, yeah. the, the tickets to this event were more scarce than any other party yeah. you know, this whole week in Miami. This is the party. This yeah. is the party. The yeah. best event of the week. I talked to Ty about uh, the fasting strategy. He's got it on the lock. Yeah, guy. yeah. <laughs> so the key is uh, the day before, the night before, you want to eat a good amount to expand your stomach. And then on the day of, you fast on the really? event. Yeah. But somebody was talking about an ice fast. I thought that was you. No, something was talking about it. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, so, was, was that Brecky? Right? right? So you no, eat a lot of ice to expand your stomach yeah. instead, right? That's, that's that's <laughs> I don't know. That, that <laughs> method's not tried and tested, you know? It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, bud. Drink to that. So you had, did you have a lot of people pay with lightning for beef steak? Way more than ever before. I would say before it was probably like 5%. And that could be because I, my setup wasn't working very well, like I didn't have enough liquidity and whatever. Um, but probably almost 40% this time. So wow, not lot, bad. And the tickets weren't cheap either. Yeah. So like that's, a, that's it's a way a higher amount. Um, for per transaction than people think a, a lightning transaction would be, right? Well, I think that's part of it. When, when tickets started selling, these were dense. Right. Like, I'm just gonna try yeah. to that was the really high. That was when I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really mouthing off you about fees. How did you get enough inbound liquidity? Because that was my worry when I was there. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm refreshing the page. Like, what if I don't get enough? Like, what if you don't have enough liquidity? I'm fortunate to like know some people.
use the high priority on-chain fee like it's worth it honest. it's worth it right like <laughs> you're gonna do that anytime hit high like pete you know it's for beefsteak that's the time to do it <laughs> by the way the freaks you got to stop being so funny because we have all of our guests in the live audience watching your chats right now instead of us so well, that, that's the real show this is just the <laughs> side show what did i miss we got into like a privacy discussion. Yeah. We're talking, Peter called the floor of 30K. Yes. We're not going to go below 30K. <laughs> Everything crashed right after. No, I said we might dip up a bit, but like, <laughs> unless Evo sells. So. I haven't even checked the price yet today. You're supposed to do it on their wallet. We're already at 200K, supposedly. Ty's feeling it. Yeah, we're at 200K. We don't it that's like how we check the up. price in the Citadel. We just we wake up in the morning and just ask, uh, we ask Ty how he's feeling. Yeah, yeah. What, what's today feel like today? It feels like 200 you know, the way I usually do it, I just wait till awesome. Bitcoin Tuesdays, and, and Matt always has the price up there, but today we don't have it. No price. So what do you think about that? Like, should I have the price up there when I do dispatch? Like, That's I the only price. time I see the price, honestly. Like, honestly speaking, like, Bitcoin Tuesdays are the only days I see what price Bitcoin is. I feel like people talk a big game about me having the price up there and that I shouldn't because out of principle, like, the price doesn't matter short term. Price discussion, yeah. But at the same time, like... People love seeing the little chart. Yeah, you know, who's like, like, what else are you gonna put up there? Well, we need yeah, like a new hybrid right? dashboard. We need uh, the prices, right? Like he's had them, but we also need mempool on there, yeah, right? We and then it. we need tap like, We literally made. Wiz is trying to build like yeah, an ultimate exactly. dispatch. Uh, so we made the BIS dashboard, dashboard on mempool, which has the BIS price index and the BIS market price, which were like the two prices that he had on there anyway. But he says it wasn't flashy enough. He wants to. Whoa. He wants to look like a. Dashboard yeah, yeah. Thing the problem is, nice is too. Clark's dashboard, Clark. the text is too small to for, uh... <laughs> I'll take a shot from <laughs> Marty Zow is asking 200k by conference say, yeah, you know, might as well. I agree. It's going to happen. Uh, I'll, be I'll believe it. I'll believe it when the day hits and, and we're not at 200k. Um, what else did we talk about today for Josh? We talked about Alzante. We talked about the Indy car. Yeah. We talked about Mara bending the knee. That was good. We talked about transactions. Very happy about that. Yeah. Oh wait, can we take a moment to shit on billionaires right now? <laughs> I'm just Let's saying. Do you want to call them out by name too? <laughs> yeah. Fuck Michael Oh, <laughs> there we go. Stop being cocks. I don't know. I, yeah, yeah. Okay, first of all, credit where credit is due. Ty was, you know, telling everyone to be cautious right out the gate with Michael yeah. Saylor. Yeah. And I mean, he literally came on the scene and then, like, started speaking in memes. Like, what the fuck? Like, aren't you guys supposed to be, like, uh, you know, hyper vigilant about all this stuff? No, you're not, right? It's bad. It's bad. It's a bad plug. Yeah. I mean, look, if Michael Saylor was all about, you know, he knew. <laughs> and if he was like, you know, if he understood Bitcoin and was in it for the right reasons, you know what? He would be disappointed in all you cucks and all you simps, right? He'd be like, why, why aren't you suspicious of me, the fucking billionaire, right? Exactly. So either way, you should be uh, highly suspicious of so let's just talk about the reality of it, right? It's like at a certain point, your net worth gets so high, you were just subject to higher scrutiny from the state than the average person, right? Yeah. And the average millionaire or even like 10 millionaire, right, has much more freedom than the average billionaire in you know these big countries, these big states. And, I mean, uh, right from the beginning, he came on board and was basically saying that Bitcoin wasn't it shouldn't be meant for payments, right? Like he was this big store of value kind of guy. And and that's, that's you know, I use Bitcoin all the time. I spend it in place, of course, right? But yeah, he basically came on the scene and was like, well, Bitcoin's not meant for payments. Like we should be worrying about it, store of value and other properties and the fact that it's- In his defense, like everyone has opinions. Some will agree with him and some will disagree with him. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also in his defense, he has a bigger lens on him than everyone else right now. And he's in that position where if he slips up, he goes out to a million people that are following him and everyone retweets it. He can't say anything without everyone seeing it. Um, I would only, the only thing I would say is that he's put himself now in a very difficult position. Yeah. You know, in, in some ways, one of the challenges to him would be to say, actually, have you become too big for what you're representing? You know, has he become like 
say, uh, like appreciate this in the same way. Has he become like a de facto Satoshi, like a spokesperson of the like Bitcoin? The voice of Bitcoin. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so you just had that podcast with, with Dan Allen about like Bitcoin has no <laughs> heroes? No <laughs> leaders. No leaders. No leaders, yeah, yeah, yeah. And is that some of the stuff that you've addressed with that? Because in some ways you're exactly right. I mean, some people do look at Michael Saylor like a sort of leader in the space. I just did one with Aaron Weinstein, and I'll tell you what he said was really interesting in that. He turned around and said, you all fucked up with Elon Musk. Harvey Weinstein? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what pedos did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, it's not pedos either. What sex, sexual assault did, whatever. Yeah. Um, but he, he said, we well, all fucked up with Elon. He said, you, you, you're you the people that don't trust verified people and you're leaping around celebrating. And look what he did. And, you know, not everyone did. But I'm just saying, like, generally speaking, yeah. he was right. I mean, I did. Complete yeah. hypocrite. Woo! Tesla. <laughs> and then, hold on. Yeah. So, yeah, but he pumps the price. I feel like there's, like, the line is blurred because Elon pumps the price. And I think we're heavy the price is going up more than we're Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're, well, we're yeah, excited yeah. to see our games go you up, can't, right? You can't disentangle yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But they are different, right? Like, I don't know. That's the end of my thought. That's pretty profound. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we all have different incentives at the end of the day, right? I mean, the billionaires have different incentives than like, the billionaires that get into Bitcoin have different incentives right. than us supply. Outside. That's the fucking key. And I think, like, I've been. I think I've been pretty consistently critical of Sailor and like the love that that is just adorned to him. I think people should be critical in general. I'm very glad that people are critical of me. We have, you know, dispatch, like we're literally just getting trolled in the live chat that's just broadcast to everyone. <laughs> yeah, quit simping for custodial is wallets, it, is it, man. It's a, key aspect, <laughs> it's a key aspect of the show. We're I like that. Big at. I'm waiting for it. Yeah. What a coincidence. At the same time, uh, yeah, huh? <laughs> at the same time, I think that Sailor has been incredibly consistent. And as far as like a billionaire compliance pro type of person, he's been a very strong advocate for Bitcoin. Like there's so yeah, many no. worse things he could be doing. Matt, are you sipping? <laughs> I'm, I, everyone get your bingo boards out. There's some nuance here, Ty. And, uh, and I, 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 think, I think that, you know, he has, he, he could be like, look at what Portnoy is doing. Look at what Pomp does sometimes with like his investments and stuff like that. And he intertwines it with all of the things he's, he like shills and yeah. whose podcast guests are. Look at Elon who's meeting with Dogecoin devs. You know, look at, you have Roger Veer, you have right. fucking, you know, uh, Voorhees, you know, like we have so many past rich leaders yeah, but nothing that have been. Then nothing compared to Sailor. Because he's been a very consistent advocate is one Until of the reasons not, why he gets Which it. is the point, right? Like so if, look, not. if, for instance, let's put on our like conspiracy theory hats okay. and say that maybe this is part of a state-sponsored attack, which, you know, it's not beyond the pale. Like we're all expecting that to happen at some point. Maybe, you know, like it's a long game where it's like you have this guy, Sailor, this charismatic guy, says all the right things, is a thought leader, right? And he's, uh, you know, he's put out there. <laughs> Right? <laughs> the comments are so good. It's Cluck Odell. <laughs> Plebs, I fucking love you. No one is above criticism. Keep everyone honest. Well, like, doesn't that sound like a good, you know, like he builds up his like. Uh, this is how you would do it. Right. That's how you would do it. It's a long And then you, we're going to yeah, bring yeah. mining to America, yeah, land of the free. Exactly. And then we're going to transaction censor yeah, yeah. everything. We're going to have a mining council. And he, had, at first, he and had that big tweet where he got like 20,000 likes and like 5,000 retweets where he was like, the perfect mobile wallet is one where you like KYC yourself and you just lend your Bitcoin for USD. So then you just pay without a tax burden yeah, via yeah. The, the USD. Well, he had this one tweet like a long time ago, which was like, Oh, you know, like uh, it was basically like the gist of it was like render unto Caesar what is Caesar's or whatever. Okay, put your hand up. You never had a bad take with Bitcoin. Oh, I have. Okay, so <laughs> we all have, you know. Uh, you thought of the bad take. You had, you yeah, had yeah. What, what had. was it? <laughs> That's all right. We're the shit load, and he's had some bad takes, but suddenly it goes out to a lot of people. Yeah. But the things that I think about with him is. Who's under more pressure when their net worth, when that, the price halves? Is it someone who goes from six billion to three billion, who's raised a lot of money through their company, who's got a board to answer to, who's got investors to answer to, 
uh, or, or somebody who has, I don't know, a million dollars of Bitcoin is going to find a thousand. Who feels that burn more? I think he feels the pressure more. I think he certainly does. But what if? Like, okay. And this is yeah. defensive. This is saying, look, that's why we, yeah. you know, we have to, we have to be on guard uh, with, with him as well. Right. The other thing is he, you know, he's brilliant, as Matt says, a great advocate, but, but he is still very new to Bitcoin. He's very new. You know, and he says all the right things though. Sometimes, like, then, like he, even in 2015, he was a Bitcoin mayor, right? Like he came, like there's tweets out there where he was like bashing Bitcoin. He didn't delete yeah. that tweet though. No, he, he didn't. did. He deleted it. He did it. No, no, no. And, and yeah, that, 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 that's, that's great. But very yeah. low bar, but it's impressive that he didn't delete it. And it, it's good, yeah. But I, I, I but what's the real threat? I mean, people, anyone can say anything, right? Like, what's the real threat? I think the fifty-one percent attack obviously would be if there's some kind of mining council that decides to. They just need to disband that idea. Someone needs to resign, yeah. so everyone else does. They can do it without a council. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it doesn't matter how angry people are. U.S. miners, and they're going to call themselves North American miners because it sounds better. U.S. miners are going to have a lot of closed doors conversations in the next 10 years. Right. And it's up to us as sovereign Bitcoiners to mitigate that threat without appealing to them to be not that. Yeah. Like that, that is obviously they're going to do that. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I hear people on Twitter being like, oh, you know, it's fine if they have closed door meetings, people are entitled to it. Yes. However, doesn't mean we have to like it, right? Like we need to kind of force their hand to be more transparent. Otherwise, it's going to make a. It's you know, like obviously in the in the long run, Bitcoin will succeed. But if we don't address these things, you know, nip them at the bud, it's going to be a big headache in the future. So, I think it's fine that we uh, complain when you know things aren't going our way. The live chat's the best part of dispatch. It really is loving it. Um, Maybe the real solution is just for everyone to have a few miners at home, even if it's not profitable, right? Just to like secure the, the network. Well, I think it'll be more profitable, right? Like, as, especially, you know, if you're looking for KYC free corn, I mean, I'd be willing to, you know, pay 30%. Yeah, I don't think so. Like, <laughs> wouldn't you pay a 30% premium for just it's nice KYC? It's not 30%, though. It's like it's, probably 300% yeah. more, right? Yeah, it's, it's more like 100 no well, there's, there's like right yeah, now, that's right, crazy. Right, yeah. there's like the right, right, mining, right? Well, like right now, you can't get the equipment, so that makes it extra expensive, right? But even when you do cost. have the equipment, yeah, even really? if you have miners for free, mines, so yes, exactly. Are they running right now? No. Where did why not? Well, someone's, someone was going to buy them, then they didn't. So now you have them. Why aren't they plugged in yet? They're in the UK. Uh, they're in. Don't tell uh, Ohio. We're on, we're, uh, Dude, it's uh, so competitive. Ohio. The network's so big. If you don't have the electricity rate, then yeah. you're screwed. That's the biggest part of the yeah. whole equation. Yeah. Yeah. Right anyone, anyone who mined at their home at a 40, 50% loss for the last 10 years has done fantastic. That's true. If you own and, long enough time and frame. Yeah, the yeah, government has no if, idea they have the Bitcoin. If you could afford to eat the cost for that long, you know? But you would have been better off just buying that. Bitcoin. Yeah, well, would, you'd be KYC though, yeah. and if you're McCormick about it, you just sent it to the same reused address. You don't care about privacy, and it's all bagged and tagged. But well, the BIS, the BIS premium, yeah, it's it's be less. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well, I, I, I used you as an adjective. It should be a compliment. Yeah. I, would, <laughs> I would argue a little bit against the government doesn't know because I mean they the government very highly looks at electricity use. But did you see what happened in yeah. Britain? It's the same way they go yeah. for weed. Yeah. It's the power usage. They, they thought in the UK, they thought the specific miner was actually like growing weed and they actually went and raided the right, place. Right, but that was a fucking operation. Like they that had a lot. Fun. Like I'm sure. talking about like in your apartment, yeah, you, just have a you have one or two ASICs yeah. that really yeah. pisses off your fucking girlfriend. You know, like <laughs> They're that, is a, that is usually a good deal. Like I, I, I don't think, I think people over or underestimate like how good of a deal that is. Excluding right now, because right now it is crazy. You cannot get fucking equipment. Like all the equipment is super expensive. It, it to a degree that we've pretty much never seen in the post ASIC era. Like I mean, there's a general like chip shortage. No, 20, 2017 yeah. also saw Apple like similar shortages. shortages. Yeah. You got wrecked in 2017 on mining, right? You wanna, is that a learning experience? Yeah. Um, Bull market was going crazy, made loads of money. Met a guy who was like doing mining, said, Do you want to get into it? I was like, Yeah. Bought 70 S9s and 70 Dragon Mints. The S9s were like 2,000 a piece. They were going, I could have resold them on 
Amazon or eBay for 5,000 apiece. I mined, took out contract 18 cents and made a load of money in January. February I broke even and then I was fucked. Absolutely fucked. Uh, the whole thing cost me about half a million dollars. Oof, Holy geez. shit, man. Yeah, boom. But if you would have kept mining for it till now, it would have become profitable, right? Yeah, but is this, you know, at the time you're like, I'm burning because I was paying my bills in Bitcoin. Burning a lot. Yeah, not a lot of people can eat that loss for so long yeah. to make it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I wasn't thinking like that. Well, that's why the stay true. humble part is the important part, so, right? Cycle one, easier said than done, right, Matt? Well, the more miners, that. like if you have like 70 miners or 100 miners, then it's kind of like doing 100x on BitMEX in a way, right? Whereas if you have like one or two where, say, the electric bill is 100 bucks a month, you don't really care. Like you can just eat that My cost. My bill wasn't 100 bucks a month. I understand. Yeah. 10, 10 to 1,000. Sure. Yeah, that's no, I understand. And that's what I mean. It's just like leverage, right? If you have 100 miners, it's like 100x. So if you just have one S9 in your house, in your closet or something, that's the way. Uh, I think that's the way. Because, I mean, we, we all talk about running our nodes, and it's important, if, especially if you're receiving payments, right? It's important to run your own nodes to verify that you received the payment, right? Um, and to verify your balance. Um, but, I mean, I don't know. I, I think especially if, if we can get things like – um, what's it called? Um, the new gender, uh, strata V2, where the miners actually. Do you think that's actually going to happen? What do you mean? Nice. There's a regulation angle to I would that, love that, right? Because, yeah. like, who knows if, the, like, let's say, for instance, just an example, if the US regulators will allow miners to allow individuals to set their own transaction um, blocks. Um, I, I don't know. I'm well, just, it's like the OFAC compliant block. Stratum 2 fixes this, right? right. So, yeah. But the thing is, what if requires... regulators don't allow that? Well, that's fuck the regulators. No, no, well, fuck the regulators. Yeah. Well, these are still U.S. businesses, but U.S. founders and U.S. No, but if you've got a miner in your house, you don't care about regulators. So that's my question. Do, but you're a part of a pool. You're no, part but it, of the pool like still has to play, like play, play a game. They're a big enough so corporation. They still yeah. have to play games. No, so they I'll use a pool in China that doesn't care about those facts. Sure. That's like the whole point. Right? They it's don't. They don't care until the hammer comes down. It still could happen. No, but it's jurisdictional arbitrage. You just, you know, go overseas with your mining pool, and, and then China's not going to care yeah, until you get pins to thrown in the cell. Then we have had know, all like you could, pool. you could try so to what? escape it so long. So what? No, I said for what? <laughs> Who cares? Well, the regulators no, will, will say whatever they want. Your money won't. Your money won't. money won't. Your money won't. They'll make up whatever. The state will make up whatever defense they need to. So, the the regulatory attacks are we done, or have we not seen anything yet? No, they're gonna keep going. Yeah, we haven't of seen any yeah. 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 this it's We're just getting started. Crazy, eventually. Yeah. Exactly. They're gonna now, go it's, the now it's all nice and, yeah. and fun, and we are just tweeting "fuck so. you" to to marathon for doing all the compliance, but it, it will be nuts, really. I know. You want to like pop your head in so that like yeah yeah yeah. Like, yeah. Ladies are here. <laughs> we do have ladies here. We can bring them. Um. <laughs> we're learning. We're learning live why uh, none of none of the competing shows have a live chat. <laughs> 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 um. Yeah, so I mean, Stratum V2, like to bring it back to Stratum V2, the, the main issue, the two main issues is regulatory compliance on the pool side. And yeah. then the second issue is, I mean, I don't think many miners want to run their own node and fucking deal with it. Would you do a quick breakdown of what Stratum V2 is? Stratum V2 is right now, and formerly called Better Hash by Matt Corallo, and then the guys That's at Slush Pool Brains um, have been working on it to create Stratum V2, they integrated it in. And the idea is right now we have the mining pools. Uh, you know, the, famously we have five or six mining pools that control the majority of the hash rate, right? It's the famous FUD. And the, the, the key issue with mining pools is the mining pool operator. The guy who's running the pool is constructing the blocks, is deciding which transactions go into the block. If that's Maripool, they're putting that on a blacklist, right? And they're saying OFAC compliance. Um, with Strata V2, the individual miners are constructing the blocks and putting the transactions in. The so it takes away the power. Right now, as it stands, if, if your mining pool starts doing fuckery, you basically have to, as a miner, you have to manually go and leave that pool and switch. So there's a lag. It's like a delayed check on the power. With Strata V2, you have that power ahead of time. Now, there's an extra nuance there that 
in a mining pool, you're sharing the fucking profits with the rest of your mining pool participants. So if you have individual miners choosing which transactions get included and they're not being profit selective and they're choosing transactions that are smaller or like, oh, like Josh has like a, a transaction that needs to confirm. So I'm going to put my buddy's transaction in the thing. You start to have issues. So there's there's an extra element there that they're kind of working through right now where they need to make sure. And that could be an attack, too, because you could have, let's say, F2 pool who also mines themselves and are a pool. They could go into slush pool if slush is the only one doing strategy, too. And every time they construct a block, they can construct it in a in a poor profitability wow. way to make every slush miner's profitability bad. So then they switch to an F2 pool or something. Well, so if you start to think in an adversarial environment, there's a lot of it's it's not so clean cut that like strategy to the future. But the classic Bitcoin thing, and I've been trying to be contrarian lately and just been wrong about everything. But the classic Bitcoin <laughs> thing is like, oh, strategy V2 fixes everything. It's just going to happen in two weeks and we're good. But you still have to put up significant hash power to do that. I mean, if, 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 if one pool were to try to attack another pool, you still have to put significant hash power just for the chance that you're fucking them over, right? So, I mean, there, there's still a significant hash power that's required. But there's um, some game theory there. It's, it's the ultimate solution is probably some kind of... Uh, <laughs> It's probably some kind of like Uncle Jim. <laughs> I, I want I want everyone to remember here, both in the in our, our in person audience and our, our our casting couch over here, that the majority of listeners are coming in through the are coming in through the podcast audio feed, so they have no idea what's going on in the live chat. So it's important that if you do interact with the live chat, <laughs> that you. Uh, that you explain what you're... Yeah, they're, they're literally like doing. continuously roasting us for like the last hour. <laughs> <laughs> like this kid with the striped tank top, he's <laughs> on ultra soul. So, <laughs> so Anthony, when we talk about strategy V2, right? Like what's going to happen is Slush is going to incorporate it first, right? Yes. So how much, per, what percentage does Slush have? <laughs> Less than 10? <laughs> yeah, it's like four or five, four or five percent. Ben, are you enjoying yourself on the show? <laughs> Basically, yeah, yeah, Ben right, just right. saw the comment of Young Lurk. <laughs> Peter is getting off, awfully close to Ben. Watch out, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually happening. Hey, he's still one of these. He's just trying to read his math. That's why. <laughs> I, I wonder though, I mean, from, from a practical perspective, like where are we at? Does anyone here know where we we are at with Strategy 2? Are we close? Are we like like years away? I mean, I feel like there was that announcement and then everyone was like, oh, this is the future. No, I think, and then I haven't heard. I anything. think this week at the conference, maybe, I don't know, something. I don't know. Announcement? It's, I think it's pretty cool. close though. That's what we always say. Like, like, <laughs> no, 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 like, 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 so. like Tap, I really tap so. fixes this, like L2 fixes this. I'm trying to be well, nothing happens overnight. I mean, no, but that's what I'm asking now. Like, where, like, are we actually close with Silver Shadow V2? No, it's like multi year long project just to get it working yeah. at a basic level and it's then, always years away. and then another few years oh, to get it like away. working. Decent. Lower your time preference, yeah, yeah, but this yeah, is something like, worth it. Like, this really exactly. changes so many dynamics and gets rid of this whole censorship bullshit that Marathon was pushing. Like, so things like this, they're worth waiting multiple years, multiple cycles even for. And it's so, gonna be much yeah. more important in the future, like a few years down the road, like, okay, the OFAC thing is gonna be actually big yeah. drama, but now- It gets more important as transaction fees become more important. Exactly. The whole point exactly. is is what, what transactions are confirmed. But the whole point of the dispatch is like, where, where are we at now? Like, where, what actionable things we can do now? And if, and if we're talking about strategy two, we're a strategy two at now. And I just, I just, it's like, if it's like, if it's still years away, then it's like, I think oh, you shit. can basically get like an S9, flash it with their uh, Brings OS firmware, mm -hmm. and then you can connect it to Slush Pool and it'll use Stratum V2. Simple, more or less. Well, I, I mean, I, well, to answer his question, I think it's like mostly working, right? Yeah. I don't know. It's my question. I mean, the big concern is what I said, the adversarial aspect, right? Yeah, that's that's the game theory thing is separate from like the technology <laughs> itself actually works. Yeah, like the spec is like, like it's all planned it's out and the, te the, the firmware works, right? But we haven't seen it in an adversarial environment. Like, so we don't really know how to go. Fuck off. Well, this has been fucking great. Um, I love that. The chat is wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, how's your car? Hey, how's your car?
Yeah, bring this car yeah, over. Yeah, bring the car, America. ship it. Send it. car with the green chip. Did you bring it over? Get the carriage. Oh, cool. Wait, the what? Get the What the hell is that? The raw. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I like how you pronounce is privacy. You say privacy. privacy. I love that. I'm gonna just adopt that. It was on this fucking language first before you kicked us out. <laughs> so I'm, I'm right. Well, you guys should have been nicer. A- us, you know? Actually, actually, so you guys spoke like us. I don't know. But sometimes I pick up. Which is what I think, yeah. right? I think it's schedule. No schedule. Schedule. Yeah, schedule. No, no, you guys spoke like us, and then like. In like, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's what like linguists say. Like you had like American accents, Park, the and then like the we've always spoke. No, no we've always that's spoke. impossible. Better than you. Better than us. Well, we are better than you. Did you say better? Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, really? But I mean, America's been kicking Britain's ass this year, basically, right? Like oh, it took what? a it took a pretty bad turn. Oh, that what? I mean, I had everything. I had everything. Yeah. <laughs> what is not what podcasting? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so we're sitting. We're sitting in in the most elite suite at Indy Five Hundred, the Ed Carpenter Suite, and uh, Pete's at one of the tables there. You know, he's got the TV on the on the side showing the race. Um, you can go outside on the two sides if you if you want to actually be a part of the race. Um, and he's, he's FaceTiming his daughter. He's got this wonderful daughter. He calls me over. He's like, Matt, like, I want you to meet my daughter on, on FaceTime. And he, he turns to her and he goes, he goes, this is Matt Odell. This is the second best <laughs> in space. And she, she turns to him and she goes, who's the first daddy? <laughs> oh, that's rough. <laughs> no, she's amazing. Um, so this has been fantastic. Uh, I may, I'm I'm inclined to say we should wrap this up. Fucking have a great fucking time in this fucking citadel with all these fucking awesome people over here. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna virtue signal that aspect. The live chat can go fuck themselves. Um, and, uh, I mean, do you guys have any final thoughts before we, we close this up and have a fucking insane night? BitcoinTV.com. Don't sue him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am the one. Oh, you're, yeah, yeah. <laughs> big cheers to all the freaks who joined us in the live chat. Big, big shout out to all the freaks who joined us here at the Citadel. Big shout out to everyone who supports the show so we're able to keep it ad free. I hope to see many of you in Miami over this next week. I'm gonna slowly walk over to the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love you all. Cheers. Good to see you guys. Yeah. Parallel paradox. <laughs> Call it the docs a little. Waking up, I check the price of Bitcoin. Scrolling on down through the shit coins. Hot damn, I'm up 20 bands. Bless us once again, like ooh, 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 ooh. My account's at an all time high. When big bulls are make bearers die. Milky bar, so the price is gon' fly away Today, today, I pray Got my bags packed, do you wish you had that? Try to tell the normies they ain't listen, now they sad, sad Big BTC, lil' bro E, GRT I've been telling y'all to grab that Bought link, I ain't even do no research Carry round bags so heavy that my knees hurt Okay, you got your suicide stack All in Bitcoin, I don't need no cash Fuck cock bucks, they suck I don't wanna pay stub You can keep the cash I'ma stack until that day come Lambo, moonshot I believe since day one Elon finna pump this shit to Mars No need to say none If you been on the sidelines Homo when it's my time Dumping on you fast here Hold my bags and watch them decline Waking up, I check the price of Bitcoin 
rolling on down through the shit coins Hot damn, I'm up 20 bands Lessons once again like ooh, 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 ooh. My account's at an all-time high When big bull tart and bearers die Milky bar, so the price is gon' fly away Today, today I pray Shout out all the homies who just stack and stack Marty Bent, Matt Odell, Mr. Swan and Max Every fellow OG on CT Loom, Dart, R&R, Loops, and Kobe If you don't know me, this is wrong Hands only have fun staying poor If you capitulate, homie I could never do that Hardly ever go flat Small ting won't do Full send it for ham cat I'm long with a whole stack I'm giga brain bull chat Okay, here's what happened before the IRS met I went full bull tart and the bearers died It sounds tall tales, but it's no lie, see I lost all my money in the exchange hack In a boating accident that happened after that Plus I'm down a couple racks from when I bought Zcash It's okay, I'll write it off, whatever helps the tax, yeah Waking up, I check the price of Bitcoin Scrolling on down through the shit coins Hot damn, another 20 bands Blessings once again like ooh, 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 ooh My account's at an all-time high When big bull tar make bearers die Eat milky bar so the price went and flew away But that was yesterday Love you, freaks. Stay humble, stack sets.